everyone, and welcome back to another edition of the TetraCast. This is RPG Site's weekly podcast where we get the site staff together to talk about our favorite genre of video games. My name is Brian Vitali. Joining me, we've got Josh Torres. Hi, hello. Happy holidays. Now that it's after Thanksgiving, you can hear Mariah Carey down in the distance. For the next month. Uh, Adam yep. Vitali. Hello. And Chow Min Wu. All I watch you is for Christmas. Okay. Why did you say it? <laughs> no, no. Uh, so uh, no James Galizio this week, and uh, we are recording. This is the Saturday after the U.S. Thanksgiving. Um, James is out with a, a family obligation. Uh, Chow is here because he's Canadian, and the rest of us are here because we figured, why not? Uh, so this podcast, like we, uh, if you listened to last week's, we weren't sure if we would hold this one. We figured we'd at least get together and talk about a few games that we've been poking through as we rapidly, rapidly approach the end of the year. Uh, this podcast might be a little bit more freeform. Honestly, news has been a bit slower. Makes sense because most of us only had a few business days. Some of us are just taking the time between you know meeting with different extended family and other obligations to poke through some video games in the gaps so we figured we at least uh, throw something here to put something up for this week because it is a busy time of year and uh, i believe uh joss was just kind of going through this for us on our end but we've got uh looks like two more regular episodes of the tetracast this year including this one and then we'll have our game of the year episode which you will not likely see until next year we usually put that up on the first is that correct uh, and so only uh, only three more recordings to go uh, for 2022, and then we're going to rapidly wrap, wrap this up, uh, put up all of our site features and go into the next year. So we figured, let's not skip a week. Let's at least meet up and talk about some games we've been playing. Uh, did you all have a good hot so, holiday? How was your Thanksgiving great? How did, you, how did yours go? I had a uh, I had burgers for Thanksgiving and it was you good. Had burgers for Thanksgiving? Holy shit. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Turkey burgers? <laughs> Uh, we had a mix of beef and turkey burgers. Okay. So. Man, I've had a turkey burger in a long time. They're good. I like them. I mean, yeah, I remember enjoying that. I just, I just never thought of like, you know, I don't know around where I could get turkey burgers around here. Well, I think, you know, sometimes preparing a whole, a whole turkey or, or a ham or more turkey, it takes a lot of work and effort and it's not cheap. So, so the burger is just more convenient. You know, I've heard a lot of people like to do pizza on Thanksgiving. So I wouldn't, I would be down for that. Did, did uh, but I think with, I'm uh, like your family or your girlfriend's family. Uh, I went over to my girlfriend's folks. Uh, oh, that's good. We had uh, we had some apple crisp. We had some turkey burgers. Uh, oh, shit. Some 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 ice cream. It was good. Oh man, that sounds so good. <laughs> okay. And they uh, um, no 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 one that I know really likes pumpkin pie. I don't love pumpkin pie, but I, I like it. And this is like the only time of year I have it. So I'm like. You know, go get to myself a, a pumpkin pie slice at the, at the local bakery or something like that. Yeah, I there was a I went over to uh, my relative's uh, place about an hour away, and they had like this gigantic uh, pumpkin pie that they got from Costco. They're like, no, like everyone was too full with like what they served that no one really like touched it. So like, when I was like packing like you know just to go food. Like, I don't know, for some reason, I ended up like half of that gigantic pumpkin pie. So it's just in my fridge. I'm like, what am I going to do? Well, with this? Uh, in, my, in my immediate in real life circle of friends, two of them had recently bought houses using the mm-hmm. same uh, realtor, real estate agent. And that real estate agent, like as part of like a parting gift, like apparently left pumpkin pies on both their doors. <laughs> so now like oh, within the circle okay. of friends, we've got like random partial pumpkin pies just who wants this and we've got one we're good and then i saw adam was uh posting a picture somewhere i think he maybe he maybe he texted me and my mom uh about like how he bought himself a pie and has just been slowly eating it throughout the week so adam how's that pie going it's gone (laughs) it's gone (laughs) it's consumed (laughs) no but yeah uh, and then chow i don't know what they serve at canadian thanksgiving i assume poutine but i don't know for sure chow oh we've, we've lost chow oh no Okay, maybe. Oh, did I not pay attention to the chat? Yeah, he, he, he went to, he oh, went to he, go eat. He oh, he, oh, he went to go. He went to go eat some leftover pumpkin pie. Yeah. All right, we'll check up with you, Chow Adam. when he gets back. How's your Thanksgiving, uh, Adam? My Thanksgiving was just a Thursday, other than okay. the pie. That's nice. Sometimes simple no, Thanksgiving I mean, is nice too. Yeah, <laughs> it's uh, you don't have to deal with any chaos. Like my, mine was weird because I I went over to my relative's place early in the day. I went over to another aunt's house. And like, it, it it was weird because you know several of the family members uh, passed away uh, sadly this year. But like you know, one of them was really good at holding like events and organizing events and preparing all that stuff. And now like you could really feel their absence. Uh, theirs was very, I I'll say scattershot. I guess is the word I use for it uh, because 
we got there. I was with my mom and my uncle there, and uh, we arrived, and we had already two foods. It's like Filipino delicacies. It's like lechon kawale and lumpia Shanghai. And then, like before we even got that food to bring over there, we're like, we should probably have lunch first because we know that at my aunt's place. They're very disorganized, and like we know, we know we're gonna eat late because they probably won't have anything prepped up. And then of course we got there, and like one of the one, one of my two cousins was like randomly hanging Christmas lights already. It's like, <laughs> and then so we just started munching on the things that we got as as we were like waiting for the food because one my uh, my other cousin was like uh, making steaks, and they were uh, they also had like um, uh, uh, st- stuff that they were preparing like asparagus, mashed potatoes. And then, like, and then as we were like eating, like more and more stuff came. Like, I didn't know the extent of this menu. Like, they, they said lobster is a possibility, but it didn't happen. I was like, oh, mm-hmm. never, okay. And then, but like as we ate, like, like at certain thresholds, like thirty percent of the meal, fifty percent of the meal, seventy percent of the meal, like there's like new stuff kept, kept coming out that we didn't know about. Like, like there was like cassava cake, cheesecake very late into it. There's like fried turkey, and then like so and so forth. And I was like, and then. It was just one of those things that you have to understand, like, at any Filipino party, at any Filipino gathering, they will always have, like, too much food. Like, there will be, like, say, seven people at a party, they'll make food for 20. Um, Mm -hmm. And and they'll hold it against you if you don't, like, eat, like, a good chunk of everything that comes out. So, like, when I'm, like, already, like, 90% full, like, done, like, like, the fried turkey comes out, I'm like, oh, my God, I'm gonna die. But I have to eat at least a little bit of it, so they're satisfied to know that I I, I ate some of it, that I have you know appreciated all that, you know. So it was no, it, it was a it was a pretty um it was, it was one of the most enjoyable family gatherings I've had in a while. Um, like I I I was expecting to drive back home around like eight p.m. that night, absolute max. That's what I was thinking roughly in my head, and I didn't get back home to like midnight because like the family stories going around there were like really interesting uh, oddly enough and i was like huh. Oh, i have it? learned as i as i get older that i'm much more in tune with just enjoying the company and things like that mm-hmm. than i did like mm-hmm. when thanksgiving gatherings were a chore that you had to yeah, deal with yeah. once once a year yeah. oh that sounds really nice and i hope everyone else here also had really good you know thanksgiving plans with lots of food or if they didn't have plans they enjoyed their thursday like adam did with his uh with his pie so he was festive mm-hmm. enough yeah, whatever so, uh, holidays you you uh you know you, you celebrate you know in this month and this upcoming holiday season, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I hope you guys all have fun and you know stay safe and enjoy it. Enjoy the company if you have any company, whether it's like physically or digitally, you know, and all that. Uh, Chow is back now. I know uh, Canadian Thanksgiving happened, you know, an eternity ago. Uh, yes. Chow, how how was your Canadian Thanksgiving whenever that happened? Um, we don't actually celebrate it, but my brother would try to make it work somehow. He would try to cook turkey, but he has no experience cooking turkey. So okay. It's All very right. awkward. Mm-hmm. So, and then my dad would be like, what the hell is this crap? It's like, <laughs> we can just cook Chinese food instead. You know? it's, just, it's just those kind of store scenarios, right? So nice. what do you have this year? Turkey or Chinese food? Thing we just had Chinese food. Right. Like we just that checks out. To some of some of us have burgers. Some of us have turkey. Some of us have pizza, and some of us have uh, Chinese food. So it's usually those kind of experience. <laughs> well, in between the gaps of holiday and family obligations, I know I have personally poked at both uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet, and finally finished up uh, Stars from the Divine Force. I got pulled away from that when I went to go play through uh, Pentiment to talk about it last week. Uh, we'll probably start out with Pokemon. Just because it's probably been the bigger news story, I think. Yeah, I know a, a couple of my gatherings. You know, one of the one of the news stories that we'll talk about. This is just a headline I'll read out first. Is that uh, Pokemon Scarlet and Violet have sold at least ten million copies combined in the first couple days of sales, and that news is a few days old. Those games have uh, sold really well, and they have obviously a very wide demographic. I know in a few different contexts, I've heard people talking about uh, those games in like some of my friend circles as we met for uh, waffle breakfast or for Thanksgiving. So and I didn't realize this. So I already knew because they said it. It was like the fastest selling Nintendo title ever. I mean, it's got the it's all the Pokemon titles are always going to be the fastest selling because they're kind of selling a pair. Um, mm-hmm. But anyways. Um, I was I, I knew it sold better than Sword and Shield, which came out three years ago, but I wasn't aware how much better Sword and Shield, which released um, at the same time, right? Like in November, I mean, 
Uh, yeah. They sold six million in a week, and now we're talking about ten million in three days. So it's like almost double in almost half the time. It's like that's yeah, pretty. It's, it's, it's almost caught up with Arceus lifetime sales in three days. You know, it's not yeah. that far yeah. off. It's, I mean, yeah, you, you, you always have these weird caveats like, well, Arceus is one game, and these are two games, but like, it's still like, what games sell five million in the first three days? Not, not many. Um, and then, yeah, just comparing it like to like with a pair of. Uh, sword and shield so i gotta ask the obvious question like what is it now compared to three years ago like why is there so much more general excitement i know there's, there's kind of two conversations here there's a general excitement and then there's like the enthusiast circle which might be a little bit more critical but like what is it about scarlet and violet that have made it do you think oh maybe i'll just lead off with adam he, he gets to guess first why are why are these uh, well, i mean jumped there's up probably so millions more switches out i mean that's that's a, th- people. that's a good point yeah because <laughs> so, the switch would have been what two years old at the time of scar uh sword and shield that was two and three so yeah two and a half so mm-hmm. yeah and I, I think it's also just easy to it's just an easy social experience you know like it's easy to just like mm-hmm. have a conversation with your friend while you both are playing the game at the same time Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, enjoying each other's company. I just think it's more like it's one of those games that like it's easy to like kind of get swept up in the moment, like say, "Oh man, all my friends are playing it. I want to get it," you know. Um, and I think that it's it's much more, it's much more. It lends itself well to that. Well, that's kind of it. Kind of ends up being like for Pokemon, it might be quote unquote easier. I don't want to pretend managing such an IP is easy, but it seems like there's this like zeitgeist that you want to try to latch on to we've seen it with like among us with fall guys with uh even valheim a little bit in the pc space where it just becomes like the water cooler talk is like oh have you heard about this thing that everyone's playing and just like what what is the strategy to latch on to that and maybe for pokemon it's pokemon so maybe it's a bit more straightforward in that case but i do kind of wonder what happens behind like marketing is departments and closed doors to try to try to weaponize that to as best as they can though i did hear uh so i have been playing pokemon a little bit uh, we'll talk about it in a couple different contexts here obviously for our site side coverage uh james has been the primary go go to person for anything related to pokemon both in the fact that he has been putting up a ton of little quick primers on the site for like how you evolve certain things how you find certain items etc 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 and also has just recently recently written his review for pokemon scarlet and violet which i will let him speak to it likely in the context of the game of the year discussion uh but the our tweet out on socials basically summarizes it kind of as efficiently as possible is that he thinks it's one of his favorite pokemon games ever at least since the ds era but obviously has scored it appropriately to the level of technical polish that the game has shown and if you're ignorant to that you just if you spend any time on facebook or twitter people are having kind of an enjoyable time i feel like taking the piss on this game for the bugs that they're encountering glitches uh, animation errors things like that um I mean, some some people are actually more, you know, genuinely disappointed. Some people are just enjoying the ride. But uh, James's guide is pretty comprehensive, and I think pretty even keeled about uh, his impressions on Sword and Shield, not Sword and Shield, uh, Scarlet and Violet. I've only put a few hours into it. Uh, my my experience so far is that I picked the uh, Sprigatito, the grass starter, but then I learned what it evolves into, and it, yes, it does do the very kind of anime original character stand on two feet. Uh, I heard one of my uh, friends says that it's wearing like a bsdm outfit and i'm like eh, maybe <laughs> uh it just to me it feels more just like anime original furry character do not steal which is like there's nothing wrong with that but i just kind of wish they did something different i think it would have been cool if it was like a four-legged zoro cat or something like that uh but i did play a little bit uh, i've played i've done like a little bit of each uh each of the story branches i've, I've done one titan two gems and one star base them all my all my moms are about level 30 ish or so so i'm seeing a lot of second forms i've done the union circle the multiplayer mode a bit and it's actually for for as much as nintendo struggles with like online infrastructure and things like that i don't have the nintendo switch online subscription so i can only do like the peer to peer or local multiplayer but i don't know it worked pretty well we uh i sent a code the the nearby switch on the same wi-fi saw the request we did a few raid battles together um and was able we we're able to just kind of go off on our own way and do whatever we wanted so i've i've had worse nintendo online experiences i guess that's maybe a low bar to clear but hey they uh they cleared that that's all it takes yeah 
I know before the podcast, we were talking about how you had uh, tried poking at this game a little bit, but you thought maybe it was a bit uh, more impenetrable, at least to your tastes. Yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I've I, I've tried my best to kind of see like what modern Pokemon is. I think I've just kind of I'm not. I think I've just kind of outgrown them in a sense. Like just mm-hmm. personally, like obviously, that's not a general thing. But I did, I just like I played it for about two to three hours, and I just I just can't get into the gameplay loop anymore. Of like, oh, I found a Pokemon, and then i'll weaken it and then capture it and then try to integrate it into my team i think i think there's something i understand obviously that pokemon will always like the way it's designed the pace of it is always going to be catered to you know young children so obviously the like the the snappiness and the pace of like the menus like might be on the slower side and like the animations like i've seen them in battle you know, mm-hmm. for me, I think it's just too slow. Like, I have to, it has to be, so, like, I, I'm just the type of person now that, like, I really like fast, snappy, responsive menus that, like, and it, it, it annoys me if I can't, like, instantly make text, like, appear, like, in dialogue yeah. so I can quickly, you know, go on to the next text after, like, I read it for, like, you know, like, a, a, a half a second. That's um, me with, like, Pokemon Sun, if I remember. I tried playing it. It was just, like, nonstop tutorials. Like, will you ever shut up? <laughs> like, like, yeah, yeah, like, before. even then, like, you get past, like, the tutorial stuff pretty fast, like, within, like, you know, under an hour, I'd say. But even then, it's just, like, I just can't deal with it. Like, because especially, like, when I run into a battle in this game, it's just, like, here's, like, you ran, you ran into a battle, sometimes with, like, a Pokemon you didn't see because, like, a lot of, like, the lower zones are, like, have, like, really small Pokemon that you didn't even know you ran into. Um, so you run into them, it takes about maybe two and a half to three seconds to properly like phase into the battle. Then you uh you have to go into like fight and then you have to go pick the move. And then once you pick the move, it'll take another a second to a half a second, a second and a half to like pull off the move, and then they pull off the move. And it's like it's one of those things like it just it's it's a it's a problem that for me that just like like in some sense I feel like I'm wasting my time because I don't I, I don't really care to like I li- I'd like to see the results of what I already did, not necessarily like the the animation work because the animation work isn't what I really come to in these game uh, these games at this point, you know. And especially when the animation work in Pokemon is pretty basic like a lot of it is just kind of rudimentary in terms i'm thinking like tail whip just it like literally just wiggles the model or and a, and a lot of moves are just like the same effect only colored differently um i don't think i found it quite as uh slow and impenetrable but there there are some things i'll, I'll be an optimist first although i will talk about one thing that i have liked so i i played diamond pro platinum and I ha- and I, then I played Arceus, so that's like a, a nine ten year gap. I will say that between Arceus and Scarlet and Violet, to me, it's still novel and exciting in a way to see, to actually just see wild Pokemon on the fields. Like sometimes it's just like a, a Psyduck wandering around, so okay, whatever. But then like I see like th- a herd of three Tauros like running across the field, like at, like in the same direction as a herd. I'm like oh, that's kind of neat. And then sometimes you'll see Pokemon hanging like on top of signs or or things like that, or near the edge, or you know, in the middle of a pond. And I don't know. It's it just seems like the natural evolution for not no longer having the random battles where you're just running in the tall grass until the the screen fades out. Um, I will just kind of say that I almost feel like there's this is gonna sound a bit silly just too many pokemon it sounds really dumb because like pokemon has like a thousand in the full pokedex now and i think the regional dex is like 400 or so but like whenever i'm in an area like i'm trying to think about like who do i want for my team of six and luckily these games nowadays i know i sound like a boomer saying this like you can go to your box at any time uh you can swatch them out pretty pretty evenly so there have been some quality of life updates but it's almost just like okay which of these 3,000 bird Pokemon do I want on my team? Or I've got like eight water types I can pick from or two rock types. And I almost just feel like the regional decks could have been, I guess I'm still from the paradigm of gens one through four, where each each region adds like 100 to 150. And then there might be like 50 old school ones. But here it's just like, there's 400 Pokemon in this in this regional decks. And this feels like a lot. And I don't, I don't know, it just feels like I'm constantly throwing out Pokemon uh, pokeballs to pokemon that i because i want to catch them i want to be kind of completionist but i know i'm never like going to pull them out of my box or if i do they're just going to sit in the back of my turn order just leeching exp until they evolve and then i'm going to put them back in the box i almost just feel like they could have called out a few just like i don't know less is more sort of thing 
Yeah, it's just I think it's just a personal taste thing at this point, and I think I think mm-hmm. that for me, that's like you know, I'm happy for the people and all the friends that like enjoy it. Like that's it's that it's their thing. That's something that they enjoy. More power to them. I'm glad that they're having. But I think it's just a personal taste thing. That like ah, uh, you know, it's just not for me. I tried my best. It seems, it seems like a common. It's it's hard to like pinpoint a specific thing as like why is this not for me. But it seems like something that is commonly stated among people who aren't big Pokemon fans, me included. The one versus one nature of it isn't that interesting to me. Like I, yeah. I, I I've I've talked before how I love like party configurations and synergizing, you know, different characters of different skill sets and kind of putting together a team. And I know you have a team of Pokemon, but you only fight one to one, and it's hard for me to really like find a whole lot of interest in that. And I, I have a friend who feels similarly, and that's the thing they point to when they say they don't like Pokemon. And um, I played Arceus this year. Again, it wasn't really my thing. I'm not trying to poo-poo on someone's favorite game, but just that one versus one nature of it is just like, to me Wait, personally, just not very interesting. Which is kind of strange, because if I, uh, this is me speaking to something that I am not qualified to speak to, but if I recall correctly, like for competitive Pokemon, doubles is like the go-to. And even if that's not the case, I do know that there's a lot of abilities that specifically are like geared towards having different parameters in doubles battles. Like not only like moves like Earthquake and Earthquake and Surf, which you know hit multiple targets or whatever, and you kind of have to plan around it, or like different Pokemon have different abilities where it might affect their ally in a different way. But I almost just feel like if Pokemon were standard doubles or triples, even I don't know if triples have ever existed in some weird off format or whatever. That, that that way you could really play with tight matchups. You wouldn't just sp- spend turns like because right now this has been an issue, not an issue, something with Pokemon where it's like, oh, I don't have the type advantage here. I could spend a turn swapping out my Pokemon or just hit the other Pokemon twice with the weaker type and not bother switching because that doesn't matter. So I do kind of see where I that... this will seem like very. Uh... <laughs> I don't know. How to, I don't know how the best is right. I know this will be a very um, old uh, opinion. I don't know when they added this to Pokemon. Oh, because, I know. I didn't want to say it, but um, I do like that when you like go when you look at a, a Pokemon's abilities and they've you know you've, they've already determined whether that move is effective, not very effective, super effective. Like it just displayed there at the mm-hmm. Pokemon uh, battle menu. Like you don't have to remember. Oh, was this? type like or this attack uh effective against this pokemon like i like that like it just remembers at a glance now like okay like i don't have to like keep a mental note every time which is effective and which is not and i and i don't even know what the pokemon type category chart is anymore at this point i i don't even know how that shakes out i, 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 I mean it's, everything. it's all you got no i mean just to me, it's the pokemon in, anime. to me uh, I'm, I'm still like fairy types brand new Wait a minute. <laughs> it's just so. Uh, it's not I new anymore. Fair, it's I, a yeah, take yeah. again. I, I mean, I'm still like steel type. That's a neat new type. Well, what are the most just... like newest type Pokemon type in these it's, games? It's like, it's fairy. It's fairy. It's like ten years old. Okay. <laughs> I didn't know if they but, kept but on they, adding I know more. they've been doing a lot of like. I still don't quite get like the difference between like. It's it's almost like the monster hunter discussion where there's like variants and subspecies. What's the difference? I know there's like regional types, but sometimes like they play with it. Like for instance, I know Tauros is a gen one normal type, but there are also yeah. Tauros in the new region. It's still Tauros. It's not a new Pokemon, but it's a regional type, but it is now either fighting type, fighting fire or fighting water. Cause there's three different herds. And this is on top of like forms oh. and then there's things like for instance wiglet we talked about as like the water diglet that looks like a tapeworm it's like okay, its own yeah. pokemon it's just wiglet it's different from diglet so it's not I a did. regional type it's just wiglet what, what's <laughs> um, the uh, scarlet violet region called again paldea okay yeah so so it's not like paldean diglet it's, it's not it's not it's diglet. not yeah there's, it's not like it's paldean wiglet diglet it's just wiglet but then there's also the regional aloha diglet which is not no. Wiglet or right. Diglet, but it is a Diglet. Okay. You know what I mean? It's oh, just God. like uh, I'm sure people like it's not that complicated. You're making you're, you guys are playing it up. It's not, and I'm sure it isn't. It's and I guess that is a way that they can say like they can reuse a certain Pokemon and its move set and its typing and base stats or whatever, and still make it fresh and new. Um, but it is just like for instance, I was like, does Tauros evolve now? No, it doesn't evolve. But now there's a fire type Tauros 
from a specific herd in Paldea. And I'm like, oh, that's... I wonder how that all translates into the card game. Like, I assume there's still a Pokemon card game, and I wonder how that all translates into mm-hmm. that. Uh, yeah, there's shiny Charizard. Do, do shinies have, like, any special properties besides, like, looking different? Yeah, like, are they powered up or like they have uh, more effective attacks like my I just my, I, my immediate answer is i don't think so but i don't know for certain if they, they might be more likely to have better ivs or something i'm not sure uh shiny hunting is also something that i just like i've never really gotten the appeal i always thought of shiny as like if you get lucky enough to find one neat oh i found a random Psyduck, only it's green now. I don't know what shiny Psyduck color is. But like if you just hatch a thousand eggs until you get your your pink Fue Coco, be like, ah, now I can now I have the Fue Coco that I want. It's pink now. I don't know. Uh I, 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 mean, you, I can also, you can also find them like out in the field, right? <laughs> I know this, I know like for any like modern Pokemon fan, like these guys are like a billion years old. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> But no, yeah. I, I'm just, like, I'm just curious on like what the, like I, I don't keep up with Pokemon once again, so I'm just like shinies or like I assume it's something that like it's just a random like I equate it to like Final Fantasy One trying to find like the that machine type enemy that can kick your ass if you're not properly oh, on the bridge or leveled. something. Or I yeah, what game that was? Maybe that was four. No, no, it's like in the very first Final oh. Fantasy, you're like trying, there's like this rare enemy type that's like that's like a machine that's like I forgot which like it's a very late game dungeon in it. That like you have like a one out of one hundred chance to like find it in a random encounter in this specific like dungeon in it, and like you're only doing it just to like fu- like fill out the bestiary, and mm-hmm. then pretty much you're, you're, there's like no real benefit outside of that. Um, I uh, so to to kind of to kind of wrap up this Pokemon talk and obviously Warmech. there we go War oh, yeah. right. War Mech and it's on like the floating dungeon and you go up, you know, up and down the bridge until you find it. Yeah. I knew it wasn't yeah. like uh it wasn't um oh, what's the I'm thinking the what's the other omega it wasn't omega it's just well, omega didn't come till 5 so right so yeah that, that's what uh, I think I'm, th- I'm thinking is. of like final, I'm thinking <laughs> that's of like final my fantasy 4 where I like how we're just like let's talk about final fantasy we're we're more well versed on that uh, I like <laughs> final final or fantasy getting... 4 or was it 4 it might be 4 or 6 where it's like by the way the goblin enemies that you fight early on have like a 1 in 600 chance of dropping the goblin summon like are people supposed to just naturally run into this it's actually like 1 in 255 oh okay 300 still, not 600 that's still pretty that's, awful <laughs> yeah so my opinion on shiny is that I would I could never see myself being like, I insist that I have a shiny Frigatito or whatever. But if I saw one in the wild, just random chance, I could see myself being like, oh, a shiny Flamigo. It doesn't evolve. It's a bird, a water type, I think. But I randomly happen across it. I'll use it. Like kind of as just like a auspicious serendipity thing rather than a, I engineered my whole team to be shinies because I hatched a thousand eggs and I manipulated the RNG by having a cross region Pokedex. Or and there's, I know there's ways to like maximize your odds in certain respects but at that point it just feels like you just ran the algorithm you got your team of shinies i'm proud of you sort of thing Uh, but it'll be interesting find that fun you know it's like freaking resetting the game like thousands of times doing this and that it's like how is that even enjoyable well i mean i i don't i don't want to like i I never want to come across as like unfairly judgmental it's just again kind of using just the josh's language it's not for me um but it would be interesting like i want to do i do want to hear once we get the chance to talk about it, likely in two weeks' time, um, James's fuller thoughts on Scarlet and Violet, because even he, he was very high on it, but also very critical. It is possible to be both. Uh, but he did say that, basically, it's the, one of the funnest Pokemon games he's played in a while with a long, long, long list of caveats. It's kind so. of funny that, like, uh, like you immediately feel James's absence because, like, the aid, the aid, the the conversation, the age group, the uh, that we're having for the conversation that we're having is like aged up dramatically. Like, just the tone of the conversation, the way that we say things, the way we remember things. It's just like it, it's the the age group. You feel it immediately rise up uh, because uh, James is like, we're, oh, we're, yeah, we're boomers like now these days. Yeah. <laughs> like we're, we're, we're immediately years, just like, you know? yeah, we're just like, oh, well, salt and pepper hair weird. getting our getting our canes out. <laughs> <laughs> like back in my day, in Gen two, there was two hundred and fifty one, and that was enough. <laughs> I don't know. So, 
All right, so this will not be the last time you hear about Pokemon Scarlet and Violet on this. Uh, uh, I do plan on playing uh, the game more. Uh, I don't know when I'll get to it. That's the theme of the last couple months. And obviously, you'll hear about it uh, back when James is on the podcast later this year. Uh, and I do know that a lot of people have been enjoying their time with it, and it is a perfect water cooler game in a lot of respects. And it does, it has done a lot to change the formula in at least since uh, I've played Arceus and not having kept up to date with the Sun, Moon, XY, Black, White. So they've done a lot, but I just don't know if it's still like, it's still at its core, kind of the same experience in terms of its fundamentals. But uh, we'll see oh, basically. Uh, it, obviously, uh, it's done well for them. It sold 10 million. Yeah, according to the sales readers. numbers, people <laughs> really like the change uh, the change up that they did. <laughs> yeah, so who are, who are we to judge? So I'll, I'll uh, then use that. I, I guess I'll just do one, one last shout out. He's got the review up on the site. We've got a ton of guys up on the site. Uh, if you want to know where a certain Pokemon is found or anything like that, it's they're really meant to be like hit, uh, responding to like Google searches. So hopefully you'll see those if you're not sure how to evolve certain things. Uh, but all of that is up on the site. Um, but the other game, after I finished Pentiment and I talked about that game last week on the podcast, I went back and finished uh, Star Ocean, the Divine Force. And I know we've talked about this back a couple weeks ago when Josh had finished it. Scott wrote the review and then James had also put a few hours into it. But then I think then he got pulled aside to do a Pokemon and other stuff. Uh, so I finished Divine Force. I got the credits. I am interested in going into the post game, at least trying it out a little bit, just because I do know that just from my experience with Star Oceans 1 through 4, that they usually have a very, a pretty darn significant post game. Um, and I, I kind of don't want to just rehash the same things that we've already stated, but like, I remember after I had the sour taste in my mouth in Star Ocean 4, enough so that I just skipped 5. It helped that 5 remained a console exclusive. And then 6 was just kind of like a me like plugging my nose and jumping in like, all right, here we go. Let's see how this is for, for Divine Force. I am, I'm glad I played it. Though I will say it, it felt the game that I played most recently that I think this compares to is Tales of Arise in terms of my reception to it where I thought it did a lot of small things well. I thought it was very comfort food, like, like, oh, yeah, I remember playing these all the time in the PS3 era or PS2 era. But then just feeling by the time that I got towards the end of the game, which I won't spoil the specifics here, but I just kind of felt like my interest had sort of run its course. Like, it, like my interest in the game wasn't sustained as long as the game's actual runtime. Which might be interesting to say because I, I just didn't you just say you're going to go into the post game? Well, I'm assuming the post game will be more gameplay focused and less dialogue narrative progression. Basically, for the Divine Force, the ending antagonist faction I just thought was not compelling at all. There's a, there, there's this group called the Scorpium. I'm going to spare the other details, but I just I just did not find it engaging. I just uh, like it was like oh I guess these are the antagonists. Like they had no charm to them. There was no edge. It was just kind of like very blanket, like evil, mwahaha, evil sort of thing. And I, by the end of the game, like I was literally almost dozing off as I beat the final encounter just because like I didn't feel like it had any climax. Uh, I, I, I should mention that uh, this isn't an exaggeration. He was streaming it and then like the credits were playing and the credits were playing. And I thought he was just, you know, taking a break or whatever. And then he gets to the fin screen. And it just sits there for a while. And I forget what I said. I believe Brian, he's like, whoa, uh, oh, here I am. How'd I get here? On the fin screen. He actually fell asleep during That's the ending so scenes or the credits. So. Was it that bad? I mean, it's, it's, well, a, it's a very well, whatever. And uh, to, to be honest, it's like, okay, you're just going through the motions. And I, I do agree that, like, I, th I think the game has, like, a really cool two-thirds of, like, the beginning. But, like, once it gets to, like, the more sci-fi uh, focus of the of the last third, it like kind of shifts the 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 gameplay to narrative uh, flow. Like the ratio of gameplay to narrative, in the first two thirds was a was a nice balance. Like you got to play more than than like what you experienced through the story because the story is like whatever. The characters are cool, but like the actual main narrative is like eh okay. But like it really really doubles down, focuses on that like in the last third with a lot of long cutscenes and a lot of dialogue that just like don't really say much and do much. It's like okay, sure, it's just like, things are happening because things are happening. You're just like, eh, okay. But it's not really, like, really engaging or interesting, you know? You're just like, you're just going from place to place at that point. 
to you know confront the threat but it's not really and then this is one thing that we've talked about a lot of times when it comes to whether or not this narrative in a jrpg is compelling but just bad antagonists like not interesting antagonists i believe his name is nayan the one that was like a, a spy for the austerius city he was probably the most compelling but even then he was like really mid really average like there there was gaston and the other the bigger dude i don't even remember her name or his name like they were Lola. just like whatever yeah they were whatever I, I, the um the, the one captain of muriel's ship was like whatever um and then the ending antagonist was like whatever like basically the antagonists were incredibly forgettable except for nayan nayan i believe the same he originally had green hair um he was okay and the rest were kind of like not like he was the high watermark and like oh like just not I, I do <laughs> i do think that like i I don't know, but it's like the way that the narrative is struck, they really wanted more playable characters. I felt like because I feel like it was a really, really big shame that like Antonio and like Lola weren't playable characters. Mm. Um, uh, like it's like one of those things, like it would have made sense that they were playable characters, but they just weren't. <laughs> it's just like, okay. Because I was like, man, Antonio's so cool. Fuck, he doesn't get enough screen time. Probably got cut out from, from the budget mm. issues, probably. I don't, I don't know. But it, like, I actually it, did kind of like, like that. Uh, I did like the... So Antonio is a, a pretty major character. He's Raymond's brother. And you meet him about 60% of the way through the game. And then he ends up being a, a, per, a pretty major character after that point. But he's not playable. I kind of actually appreciated that. He was just like... He wasn't Raymond's long-lost brother or like oh. turned evil brother or, or anything. He was just his brother. Like, yeah, it's Antonio. He's my bro. He, he captains the ship and he's important and he's capable, but he's not a party member. I don't know. I kind of appreciated yeah. that vibe. Yeah, I mean, like, like it, it was nice that like Raymond had like a normal family, you know, like like, 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 you, like you meet another, like his dad, like later on as well. And like, mm -hmm. he's a normal dude. It's like, he has like that, that same eccentric thing. It's like, oh yeah, this is definitely Raymond's father. You can definitely see it in, in, mm -hmm. in him, you know? And like, it, it, it cracked me up the first time you saw him. Uh, and, and like there's a there's a certain cutscene that like you're you're phoning in and his and his dad answers and like when his dad answered like on the screen like he was doing like that weird like thumbs up yeah pose. And then, like I was dying because like that that's something that Raymond does like one of the pre cat animations that like Raymond does and then like right. when you see him pop up on the screen like his dad's doing the same thing it's like okay that's pretty good. <laughs> One one of my favorite pre canned animations, like you, it seems like a silly thing to like highlight. But I remember two or three weeks ago, you had mentioned that you found them like quaint, because so many games now have like bespoke mocap for every scene, and if it's anything less than that, we judge it as being cheap or whatever. But no, this game knows what it is. Almost all the animations are just like either every single character in the party probably has like six and different animations that they do and one of raymond's is where he puts his like head in his hand and like very slowly there's one where he's like semi-embarrassed so he puts his head in his hand there's one where he's like concerned about something but he puts his head in his hand and it's the same animation and i don't know this is really really kind of goofy just to it's see like it's campy but it's funny you know and I'll, I'll take it if it makes me laugh uh and i'm enjoying it then all right i guess i'll give you a pass because i'm, I'm having a good time this is not really animated animation related, but that Mariel has mm -hmm. uh she's she's the uh the Kenny space cadet that you find basically about halfway through the game. Um her outfit like really flares out because she's wearing like this big metallic jacket sort of thing. But because it flares out so far from her body, she has to hold her arms at like a 45 degree angle, kind of like Limmel did in four. <laughs> it almost and it, and it, <laughs> yeah, it's almost like a tifo. And I'm just like, couldn't you just have like changed this outfit slightly just to not have no. to require that? And, and the, her outfit is fine. It's not like, you know, we talk about like outfits that are gaudy or revealing or anything. No, it's it's fine. It just flares out really far. So therefore she has to stand like that. Or otherwise, I assume her arms would just <laughs> clip into her hips or, or yeah. something like that. And it just and like she and she emotes and like has her own can animations dealing with that. Um, but speaking more about the gameplay front, uh, I was kind of bad. Like this game seems like the sort of game that you could really dive into and see like, cause there's eight or nine playable characters per path um, with like one optional option each. And uh, I really kind of like, I got my first four Raymond, Leticia, Albard and Nina. And then I didn't really change from that too much. Cause I, I guess I kind of got in just go mode. Like I found an engine that works. I'm just going to use this. It pretty much covers all your bases in terms of like semiomancy and healing and attacks and things like that. So I'm like, all right, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, experiment with the other ones but i feel like this could be the sort of game where every character gets like nine to eleven active abilities three to four passive ones um and then there's a lot of options in terms of like 
the factor effects on gear. And I'm guessing if I go into the post game, I'm going to have to d- dig into this a lot more. Um, meal effects. It's it's like one of those games where it's pretty easy breezy if you want it to be. You can turn the difficulty down. You can just use Raymond. Um, you can just spam your strongest abilities and probably have a pretty good time. But it has a lot of like hidden depth to it that you can kind of engage with if you wanted to. Yeah, like like I had like I had the, I had a stupid fucking strategy once I got Muriel. Like uh, she she has like a like a certain moves that like are, are, are effectively shotguns, and there's a lot of like modifiers on like pieces and accessories that you get that like say, hey, if you're like at point blank range plus this um, percentage of attack power if you're like mm-hmm. you get to that point blank range so you're just like just eviscerating uh enemies as soon as like you get up close to them and then mm-hmm. they just like instantly die you know and she attacks very fast too and it's a, a low ap cost so there's a there's a lot of like depth to like you know how you build out characters like a My- midas or midas uh like he has a move called speak Yule that just basically covers the entire screen like in a big ass explosion Mm-hmm. And like, there, there's some builds you can do do with that too, and just like uh, to instantly like clear out rooms in an instant, um, because of the way semiomancy uh, works and uh, how you can cast it in midair. So there's a, there's a lot of like, just like in like other Star Ocean games, there's a lot of like you you can be play in a basic way, and that's totally fine because that works, and that, like the game is flexible enough to accommodate for that. But there's also just ways to just completely break it, and uh, that's part part like you know part of the charm of the Star Ocean series. For people, it's just like they're just ways to like completely crush its back. And I will say that I really enjoyed like the the blind side, the flying, the, the all the stuff with Duma. So much so that there's a part late in the game where Duma is preoccupied. Uh, Duma has to like hack a console, and I'm like, why can't I? Oh wait, it's because Duma's hacking the console. That's why I can't zip around the battlefield anymore. Gosh darn it, <laughs> sort of thing. Mm-hmm. So it was one of those things where I got really used to that. Um, and then there's there's a, I guess there's a mode that I didn't use so much where you can have Duma like buff your party members instead of being a movement ability. Like there's there's some passive skills. Like this game has a lot of progression systems. You spend skill points to update uh, your um, your your active abilities. You can use them on your skill tree. You can use them to update even like your item creation. And I've actually seen like some forums like if I use my skill points to update my item creation abilities, does that mean I'm not going to have enough for the skill tree? It seems like the general answer is is that. Kind of like Dragon Quest XI, you can craft items that give you skill points. So technically, there is no limit. It's just how much headache do you want to like, because uh, you can level up your item creation just by doing item creation, or you can shortcut and spend skill points to just immediately cap out. It sounds like a lot of guides are just like, pick a reserve party member and just spend their skill points to cap out smithing and have them be your smither and then just don't use them in battle or whatever. Um, but then there's the there's the Duma points where you can use that to upgrade Duma's passive abilities and eventually pretty late in the game, maybe like just before the halfway mark, you get the estuary cage which is like a, a duma mode where instead of being able to use like the movement abilities it just is like a passive buff that allows you to it, like increases your defense by default there's you can improve improve your passives to make it like just make you do 10 percent more damage i think there's a few other options but i was like nope i need the movement i'd rather do that than 10 percent more damage so i don't know i just i really enjoyed the freedom of movement the fluidity of no no but no uh random battle screens I don't know, just a lot of the stuff under the hood I actually thought was worked really well. And I found that I never found the game boring or slow, which is why I think I like this game more than the game that I think of it as almost like it's contemporary in a weird way, Tales of Arise. Because Tales of Arise, I would probably say is like got more competent production values, uh probably better voice acting, at least in English. Um is prettier has it probably has more going on for it but i just enjoyed it less and i think a lot of that is just kind of pacing where uh the boss battle pacing in tales of our eyes the dungeons are way too overlong i never really had that problem with divine forest it felt like every every time i had kind of gotten a gimmick like with the caves on raymond's planet or in the or in the final dungeon with like the digital space in divine forest like nothing overstayed their welcome so i just think divine forest is just a pretty well paced game so I, so I kind of appreciated. I'd rather have that with a trade-off of slightly lower production values than the other way around, which is what Tales of Arise felt like to me. Yeah, I, I have the, yeah very similar mm-hmm. feelings as well on that. It's just I, I just like that it's like it's just very snappy, very it's always on the move. You always feel like you're mm-hmm. in control in Star Ocean. While in Tales of Arise, it feels like you have to wait for the animations to like you know end before you can do something again. Um, so it's just like you, you, you uh, in some in some aspect, I feel like I was watching Arise more than I was playing it because like it's trying to be mm-hmm. fancy with the way with the fidelity of like what it's trying to go for, which I appreciate on some level. 
but at the end of the day, like there has to be a balance uh, between that and like actual control. I do think that both of them really, really fumble their endings in terms of oh, yeah. narrative. Like I, I don't care Absolutely. about either game, how either <laughs> game ended. I would actually say that maybe a, a rise is worse. Uh, I- yeah, Let's yeah. See. Ar- Arise's ending was just a nebulous. I don't even remember like all the details, but they 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 like they Did stood the, up something are, are to gonna, be the antagonist. Spoil the ending of Arise now. It's been a year. Uh, <laughs> it's been a year. <laughs> and already it's been a year. Is, like the final boss is like this non the spirit of the like, planet. Planet, and then at the very end, that random dude who's just kind of insane just shows up again. He's like, "Kill me," and then you kill him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Was that really not it? not not Sephiroth? Yeah. And he's like not actually like the villain, really. He's just kind of like an insane guy. Like he's not like the cause of the conflict. He's just a dude, insane dude. He's yeah, a bunch of bath insane. salts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, in the both games unfortunately didn't captivate me there, but uh, Divine Force I still appreciated. I probably because it's more like it, it's more like overtly what it is, where it's like, yep, I know what I am. I'm a I'm a JRPG from what you remember from 10 years ago. And Tales of Rise kind of like, it's like, nope, we're, this is the new era, but I still play and feel like a JRPG from 10 years ago. And so, like, they're not too far apart from each other. I'm not saying Divine Force is great and Tales of Rise is not great. It's just that both are fine. Divine Force, I think I appreciated my time with a little bit more by the time I was done with it. Is it a top 10 game of the year? I don't think so. We'll discuss it, but like I still I'm glad that I played it. I'm glad that I plugged my nose and jumped in and be like, what's Star Ocean like these days? Oh, it's like this. That's not too bad. I enjoyed it for what it was. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, when you've, when you've had like a, a, a string of uh, not great mainline titles for a while, you know, mm-hmm. it's nice to have a W. <laughs> it was, and I did, I know this is very like fan baity, but there, there's a part of like Star Ocean the Divine Force does tie into some of the other games in, in certain ways. So like, oh, I played. I played those other games. I recognize oh, I, that. That's I recognize out. that name. They said it. They said a name. I recognize. I know what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, this game's so cool. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> that's all. Yeah, that's all you need to get my thumbs up. Hopefully, that's not actually true. But I, I did. I did appreciate it. Well, the next time we talk about Stars and Divine Force will probably be in uh, two weeks in the Game of the Year context. Uh, another game that came out probably at the early onset of this deluge of games that we haven't talked about since. Uh, Came out on PC just last month, or sorry, earlier this month, and that is Valkyrie Elysium. So this game it came out a few months ago uh, on consoles, and Josh was able to speak through his uh, feelings on that game back then. It has since then come out on PC, and I think a few more people have played it. Specifically, I'm going to turn the proverbial mic over to Adam, who I do know is waiting for the PC release for Valkyrie Elysium, and has, uh, I believe you've uh, started and finished this in the last couple of weeks. So I just kind of want to give you a chance. I think we've only talked about Valkyrie Elysium one week out of the several last months. So here's just another chance to revisit revisit the game as a podcast and just uh, have your uh, new take on the game as someone who's thought really highly of uh, Valkyrie Profile and Profile 2. So, I mean, the bottom line is, is I don't really disagree much at all from Josh's point on his review and when he spoke about it on the podcast. So, like, I'll talk about what I don't like first, I guess. The story of this game, first of all, it's like a retread of Valkyrie Profile in kind of a loose way. And on the, just regardless of quality or anything else, it just kind of feels a little bit unoriginal. It's like quite literally like almost like the same predicament with the same like relationship between Valkyrie and a character. And it's just, it's not even done as well as Valkyrie profile. It it just, that alone is just kind of like, you couldn't do anything more interesting with these other than just sort of like retread what has already been done. I don't know. Yeah. It's it's like, it's very, it's, it's, it's a linear stage based, but like the, the premise is still the same of like this, this uh, Valkyrie, uh, new Valkyrie that you don't know the name of, like you know, her job uh, set forth by Odin is to go and purify the souls of this dying world. Yeah, uh, and then uh, so if you've played Valkyrie Profile, the original, which is an excellent game, one of the biggest—it's not really even a twist in the game. It's just kind of the way the story plays out. Is that Odin is not necessarily uh, a good guy. <laughs> like he's selfish and he's doing things for his own personal gain and whatnot. And a big, a big uh, mechanic of the original game is basically how loyal you are to him. So if you played that, very first thing in this game, as a player, you're not going to trust Odin immediately. Like, that's just because you've already experienced this other game. And, and 
early on in Valkyrie Elysium, you meet the other Valkyrie, whose name is Hilde, and she basically says, like, ha, you don't know anything. Well, bye. And then <laughs> I, 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 I hate that. Pretty much. Like, yeah. you, not lying. And then I feel like you, a lot of games her, like, Yeah, and then you meet her, like, five or three chapters later or whatever, like, halfway through the game again, and she basically says, ha, huh, you still don't know anything. Well, bye again. And then she leaves again. <laughs> And then you meet her a third time, and she's like, huh, you still don't know anything. Well, later. Seriously, like three times. Uh, that's so sick. That, that's, and it's just kind of like, really? Really? And it's kind of obvious what she's trying to say. Like, how can you trust Odin and be his lapdog? But she doesn't actually say it. Like, you could have probably avoided a lot of this if you just, like, said something. Like, had a conversation. Just either talk. either said something or don't say something. Don't just be like, uh, "Do you get it yet?" I, I, like when you talk about that, I was thinking, of course, of like Yoko Taro work near, where it's like they don't like it, it breadcrumbs it, but it doesn't say like, "Do you notice something amiss? Do you notice? Do you, are you thinking about this hard enough?" It just just let it be, just let it lie, and then reveal it when you're going to reveal it. You know, don't don't find this weird middle ground where it's just like, "Do you realize it yet?" Do you understand what's going on? Do you get it? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And, that, like, and in terms of the main storyline, that's pretty much it, like 80% of the way through. And then, like, in the last chapter or two, you learn about who Valkyrie is and also who Armand is, which, again, if you played the original Valkyrie profile, you kind of already guessed it. You know, it's not very subtle. And it's the way they pretty much it was so funny. <laughs> it's pretty much I gotta, a retread. I got to stop laughing. I'm like, I, okay, I get that. <laughs> Like the first time you meet Armand in the game, and Armand is just like he's not a nine harrier, he's just a a human. He's just a dude. And he's like, I'm looking for something, but I can't remember what it is. And like immediately you're like, Oh, he's looking for Valkyrie. He just doesn't know it. Like, duh. <laughs> and then you finally reveals that later, and then you learn about who Valkyrie was and whatnot. And it's just kinda like, I've already seen this. <laughs> like I've already played this in terms of like the premise. Um also the way that Ein Harriar or Ein Harriar stories. I'm gonna. I'm always gonna pronounce it Ein Harriar because that's how they did in the original Valkyrie profile. But I don't think funny. that might have been correct. Yeah. I think it's more like Ein Harriar. Anyways, um, the way that their like stories are presented is also just really weird. So in the original game, you got these. You actually get like these little vignettes, like scenes, dialogue, and uh, of showing these characters and basically how they died. And I've talked about this on the podcast before, how like these are actually really sentimental, really moving, you know, engaging vignettes. But here, like there's the four different Einherjar in the game and they have like they're from like four different kingdoms. But you only learn about these by like picking up the flowers, the, the hollow blossoms that are basically just like it's like a sentence or two that and I don't I don't want to mean explain all the the mechanics of the game again, but you just pick up these flowers and they kind of just have like a sentence or two of uh, without context about like that world or that city, that kingdom. And then you can kind of put it together like, Oh, this is what this kingdom was or whatever. And then when you like do the, when you get the Ein Harriar, uh like memories, literally what it is, is you go to the menu, you go to the Ein Harriar, and you like click the memory sequence. And then it's just like, text appears on the screen and it's voice acted but it's not like there's no visuals it's not even like uh fantasian or lost odyssey where there's any sort of like artwork or scenery or flowery text or anything it's literally just like typewriter text on the screen voice acted like an audio log almost about the einherjar's past and you're stuck in the menu while you're listening to this i believe yes and just kind of like i don't want to like just sit in the menu listening to like text like and it's, there's nothing visually interesting about it it's just you know something about the i know years past and it's just like the way this is presented is just not good like sure you can listen to all of it and then learn about the unhair yard but it's just it's almost like telling and not showing so it's just yeah so it's, just, it's, it's it's a it's a weird game because like they're you, you like of course like you know the the people who made it have definitely at least a scene valkyrie profile if not play, played it themselves. And it's just like, it's kind of a weird, like, mishmash of like, we want to take this from Valkyrie profile, but we want to, like, but we want to change this part about it. And it's like, okay, I get like, we want to, 
instead of the vignettes, we want to go our own way and just put those into like collectibles and then have it them present through presented through text. And it's like I'll I'll be, I'll be honest, I kind of listened to the first person's like text box thing, and I'm like, there's four other on Harry R with six of these each. Man, do I really need to listen to these? And it's just. It would have been maybe better if they were literally more like audio logs in other games where you could listen to them as you're like running through the level. Yeah, that's what and I was thinking. I, that, that, they kind of did that. They kind of did that at the beginning when like when you're following around the first time Harry Yard like through, the, through that little village in town. They yeah, kind of did of. that. But <laughs> that, was, that was just kind of part of the story. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just very weird. And I'm not even saying like typical audio log design is great. It's just that would have been better. <laughs> Um, but anyways, uh, going back to things, going to things now I actually like more is the actual gameplay. Of all the games this reminds me of, it actually reminds me most of Kingdom Hearts, in that uh, it's an action RPG. It's relatively simple, maybe a little bit more complex than Kingdom Hearts. Um, and I don't, I don't need to explain all the uh, mechanics over again. But it's pretty good in terms of like uh, you have a weapon type and an element type, and enemies are weak to either. So. Um, every, all the weapons have different combos. There's, there's like four or five combos per weapon and there's like six to seven different weapons. So there's plenty of variety. Uh, I played on the hardest difficulty, so it was pretty challenging. Oh, you played and, on the new Valkyrie difficulty? Yep. That's sick. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, the, the first level sucks most because you don't have the healing spell and you don't have an on Harry R. Oh yeah. <laughs> so, oh crap. Um, but once you get that, once you get your first on Harry R, and once you get the healing, it's still pretty hard. But it's like okay, at least it's better. But um, but yeah, the, I think the combat is pretty good. You know, first stage based game, like I said, kind of reminds me of Kingdom Hearts. Take that as you as you will. Um, you know, and I think there's plenty of variety. You're not just doing the same combo over and over again. There's reason to switch up weapons. I think all the different weapons are are usable and all have uh. Especially on the hardest difficulty, you need to exploit those weapon weaknesses of the enemies um, to do notable damage. Yeah. And, you know, I thought the, the combat itself, I wouldn't say it's, like, absolutely fantastic, but it's pretty good. So, long story short, I pretty much agree with what Josh's review said, which in a nutshell was basically this, you know. It wasn't so hot on the story and like the combat. Uh, he mentioned that, Josh mentioned in the past, that the soul chain helps a lot because it helps, you know, speed things up to, like, zip from enemy to enemy. Um, across the battlefield rather than just, you know, running. So that that singular mechanic does add quite a bit of of dynamic flair to the combat. But yeah, in terms of, like, the premise and the execution of the story, both of those, it's just like, this is not what I wanted. It's not interesting at all. I've already read this, or I've already played this, and it's just not good. Yeah, it's one of those things, like, uh, like I mentioned in my review, it's like, it's, like it's, a, it's, a, it's an okay foundation. There's plenty of things they can improve upon, but I think... You know, you you improve upon the gameplay and kind of you know make big uh, changes to like how you present the story, and I think you have like a solid like something really solid there. You know, so if you're if you're if you're using this game as a as a way to like establish the foundations of your gameplay, it's like okay, I'll I'll, I'll give it that, and you know, and obviously there, you can only go from up in the way that like the story and the present the way it's presented with the actual like tale that you're presenting. Obviously, I don't know where you'd go where you go with this story. After the way, because it has multiple endings, and which story, which ending would you want to go with? Because they're all, you know, pretty different in the way that like they they wrap up. Um, but like, you know, I I stop one of those things like, oh, I would never want to see like an Elysium tour. So it's like it's like I'm interested. No. Just just give me something. You know, there there are clear improvements that you can make, and if you can make those improvements in an Elysium too, I'd I'd more than welcome it. You know. Mm-hmm. Now, lastly, I did play the like the two additional modes they added. Yeah. Um, so there's two of them. There's Hilda's Vengeance, and then there's uh, Seraphic Gate. Hilda's Vengeance is really just kind of uh, these aren't like story things at all, really. Um, Hilda's Vengeance is basically like a, it's like an expanded boss rush mode. You're basically going through the same maps in the game, um, maybe in like a reverse order or backwards order or whatever, um, controlling Hilda instead of the Valkyrie, and she uses a weapon that's similar to the spear. I Think, I don't know if it's like 100% the same, but it is very similar anyways to, to the Valkyrie Spear weapon. And um, it's kind of just like a boss rush mode and it's more arcadey and it's pretty, you know, it's pretty fun. It's not a reason to buy the game really. And, you know, it's a free update of all things. Um, but, you know, it's just kind of like a boss rush mode with a different character. 
and it's not too hard. The traffic gate mode is much more difficult. It's basically just like 20 challenge battles that you have to do in a row. And um, this took me a long time to do oh. it because if you uh, if you fail a battle, you have to start over. So oh, by the wow. time you're getting to the end, you're like, man, don't fall. And how it works is um, each battle has like a preset loadout of of weapons and magic. So there are some battles, for instance, they don't give you healing magic. Mm -mm. Uh, and you don't maybe not have a healing potion. So it's like, ah, oh, shoot, I, if I can't take damage here, or because I cannot get it back. Um, and you have to use certain weapons for certain enemies. Sometimes this seraphic gate mode is a dick where it like puts you up against like one of those plant enemies, but it doesn't give you the plant enemy weapon that's good oh, against no. them. And it's like, no, why don't I have to use a, an inefficient weapon on this plant? Those plant things suck. Oh, Especially yeah. They're, they're, they're annoying. Hell, hell yeah. Um, anyways, but yeah, I did those two modes. Um, for, for beating the seraphic gate mode, you do get Nibelung Velesti 3. Okay. Which has its own animation. Nice. For doing it. Uh, so, um, isn't there's that like the a reason case of it. like, isn't that the classic case? Of like, now what do I use this on? Well, you can bring it back to the main game. So, but, but it's uh, like even then, like Nibelung Velesti in general does feel so bad and inefficient to use because he uses so much mana. Yeah, like it's like for other things. It's it's like five or six charges, and it's like this could be two heals, three magics, and you know, a different thing like yeah. <laughs> like it sucks because like you want to use it because it looks nice but then like you, you use it it's like okay but it still is like way more inefficient than like anything else i could have used this on yeah i agree it's just basically for for just the flavor or the fun of seeing it the animation <laughs> yeah. of it but otherwise it's like uh not actually practical not too much um but yeah that's that if there is a valkyrie elysium too I wouldn't mind if the gameplay was mostly the same, you know, with maybe a few tweaks, but I really hope they just take the Valkyrie, like, obviously it's not like the same, so there, there is no, like, canon connection between Profile and Elysium, but they have similar settings. But, like, you can take the setting and maybe do something more interesting with it, yeah. you know, rather than just a retread. And unfortunately, when you first started talking about this, I was, I thought you were going to correct me, because I, I kind of led off the conversation to you bringing up Valkyrie Profile. And like, well, this isn't a Valkyrie Profile game. It's Valkyrie Elysium. But it sounds like they're trying right. to have their cake and eat it too, where they're being like, yeah, it's not Valkyrie Profile, but do you remember Valkyrie Profile? <laughs> sort of thing. Yes. Where it's like, well, don't don't judge us for what we're not. It's like, well, what do you want? So um, so I guess both it, of all three of these basically, games... It's basically like, it's one of those, it's like, we want to repackage and repre re uh, like revisit Valkyrie Profile, but we know people don't like the turn-based battles these days. They're they're too impatient. So, and even then, like you know, Yoshi P with Final Fantasy XVI, it's like you know the kids, you know, the gamers don't like turn-based these days. Everything's all about action, action. So that's why even action RPG route. You know, well, do you guys remember Vakuria Revolution, guys? It's a bit <laughs> like that turn-based. I, I will admit, when I was playing Valkyrie Elysium, it reminded me of Valkyrie of Valkyria Revolution. Okay, I was, I never got reminded of Valkyrie Revolution. That, that that that's actually a, like a big diss to Elysium. Like at least I had fun like playing Elysium Valkyria Revolution. I was like, please God, just end me, end this game, I, or end me. And I'm talking about more than just like a title similarity in Valkyria and Valkyrie. It was more just like this is like a spin-off with a totally different type of gameplay that's maybe not as good, but not as not as bad as Valkyrie Elysium is not nearly as bad as Revolution. Um, mm -hmm. I, probably, Revolution? I, know, I know I've mentioned this on a podcast before, but it's been a while. That's one of the only games I played through where I just skipped every cutscene. I just couldn't. I just couldn't. It was I, too I, slow. I just... Moved like molasses. Um, so I, I beat the game. I don't know what happened. I know you fight like the same three bosses like four times each. It's so bad. sorry. We're on a tangent now. It's so, bad. it's so bad, dude. Like I just, I just like when when, when people was, like they say like, "Hey, think of like the worst game that you've fought, played like in the last like ten years." Like I immediately think of Valkyrie Revolution. There's so basically, nothing else that comes to mind besides the Valkyrie result Revolution. is Valkyrie oh, Valkyrie Elysium is better than Valkyria Revolution. That's the bar we set. There we go. <laughs> high, high, high bar. I know. This is, I know. I've said this before too, but I think it's this is so telling. So Valkyria Revolution came out on like the end of June in some year, like 2017 or whatever, 16. Um, we went to E3 that year, and the Sega booth 
had a bunch of games, but not that one. Even though it was coming out in just a few weeks, they knew, like, well, there's no point. We're not going to promote this. It's not worth it. Oh, man. Well, what was the studio behind Valkyrie Revolution again? It was, uh, media, it was uh, media, media Visions. Media Visions. Media Vision. yeah. I told you, man. Media Don't let Vision, them make action Vision. RPGs. It's okay. They have, they have a lot of things in the works, apparently. It has to be heard. So, yeah. so they're off, I'll be NFT project. <laughs> Don't say that. You might have funny. Ah. <laughs> Okay, Pachinko, a step better. All right, let's go, finally. Something that I can play, then. Well, thank you, Adam, for uh, allowing us to revisit Valkyrie Elysium. Don't want to let that fall through the cracks uh, as we get into the end of the year stuff. Then, obviously, I talked about Star Ocean, a little bit of Pokemon. Uh, I know there's a few other games that we've been poking at the last couple of weeks, like Tactics Ogre, Reborn, and I'm, I'm sure I'm missing one here, but... It's a lot. Uh, yeah, Asta Libra, we've brought up a few times on the podcast that I know that Josh and Chow have both, I think, finally clocked completely. Uh, Finished the postscript. So. That postscript is pretty lengthy. How long, how long did postscript take you, uh, uh, Chow? Uh, like 10 hours. Okay, yeah, it's pretty lengthy. So, you know, it, 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 it is the additional story that happens after the main game. I, I treat it, it starts out like a new game plus of like the Dark Souls games, but with its own story and its own unique take. That's how I put it. Yeah, oh, it, no. it, it it very much is like it's like wow, that's I didn't know where it was going to end up, but I sure didn't think it was going to end up there. <laughs> and with that, we'll go on into the like news section of our podcast. It's kind of a bit lighter this week because it was a holiday week in the U.S. At least, um, I guess. Before I go on to that, one other thing that I do want to make sure that we shout out is that we do have a feature running on the site right now. It is a poll. It is a poll for the best. Final Fantasy game. So Final Fantasy is quickly approaching its 35th anniversary, and our site in a lot of ways was founded by big Final Fantasy nerds, and this is a poll that we've ran uh, a few times in the past, every five years. I believe the 20th anniversary was the first time they ran it. I think the 25th was really when it really started taking off. Uh, so we have a uh, a page up on our site that we've retweeted out a few times. I believe it's also currently one of our cover stories if you go to rptsite.net homepage. And it's just a, uh, a poll for taking on your thoughts on your favorite Final Fantasy game. And then there's some additional questions about like your favorite protagonist and then uh, what your thoughts are for the upcoming Final Fantasy 16, whether you're going to be day one or thinking about it or skipping entirely. So just kind of a fun little fan, uh, kind of a reader's poll sort of thing. So go ahead and vote in that if you'd like. And obviously uh, we'll like to kind of wrap up all the results on that, compare it across the years. I believe like the last time we ran this poll, Final Fantasy 15 scored pretty well because of like a recency sort of a bias there we'll see if that maintains or if it's fallen off if final fantasy 14 is i'm assuming still gonna respond very highly but go ahead and give a vote on that i don't know quite exactly how long it's running uh i believe it'll be through the end of the year but i'm not certain on that and i guess i'll also say that be on the lookout for a reader's poll for your favorite game of this year 2022 usually you run that throughout the whole month of december we'll probably put it up right on december 1st and basically obviously as a site we will be planning to run through our own deliberations for our favorite rpgs of 2022 but then we also have always well i won't say always in most of our recent years run concurrently a reader's poll and then it's always kind of interesting to see what we decide what the readers decide for the favorite rpgs of 2022 or any given year and then attached to that will also be uh, what you're anticipating for next year, for 2023. So we'll kind of determine a list of games that we presume are going to be releasing in 2023. We don't always nail it. There's a few games that have been on the uh, most anticipated list a few times as they get in inevitably delayed. So we'll be running a poll for the most anticipated games of next year as well. So those will likely go Bamboo live Fan on December 1st. Bamboo 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 is coming out oh. next year, for <laughs> sure. For sure. <laughs> What, were you going to say uh, the same thing? I was totally going to say the same thing. <laughs> yeah, that's the first thing I thought of. I was like, all right, another relink <laughs> on that list. This I'm, time pretty sure Breath, I'm pretty sure Breath of the Wild sequel has been on two most anticipated lists, 2021 and 2022. It's like, okay, I guess we can put it next year for sure, right? It's got a subtitle now. So it's it got a release a date. <laughs> uh, technically, it has a release date, you know? They yeah. wouldn't lie to us, right? And it's and just sometimes, like how, I think like how Starfield was going to come this year, right? Yeah, well, Starfield, I kind of felt like was inevitably going to be delayed once. Mm. But then, like, always as it goes through, like, we always talk about these games that we can't quite nail when they're going to come out. But we always always we always get the games like Soul Hackers or Divine Force or um, Dio Field, where they get announced and released within the same year that or, they come out. Xenoblade. So, 
Yeah. Or is, is Xenoblade that too? Really? Yeah. yeah. We, it was announced Man. in February and released in July. Yep. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, Nintendo yeah. Is pretty good as a publisher on that. But yeah, so it's always crazy to look at what we think we're going to be highly anticipating for uh, this year, and then what ends up being like our the ones that we actually like taking to the best. Uh, as a site, if you don't remember, uh, our, as a site collectively, our most anticipated RPG of 2022 was Triangle Strategy. I think it's still kind of up there. I think a lot of people had a good time with it, but it's interesting to see like where it ends up actually like falling through uh, when we kind of compare it to all the other surprises like Xenoblade Chronicles 3 uh, as they've released it's this year. It's a difficult year for yeah. strategy RPGs. There's so many good strategy RPGs this year that's like, mm. it's going to be tough. It's a, it's a tough ground yeah. this year for strategy RPGs. Yep, so Final Fantasy 35th Anniversary. It's just a fan poll for our site. And then uh, look ahead. So that poll is up now. And then look ahead for the um, reader's poll for 2022 favorite games and 2023 most anticipated games. All right, on the news front, uh, we pretty much kind of have three blocks of news here. Uh, we have a handful of trailers. Then we have some release dates. And I think we have one sales update. So a little bit light, uh, light on the news front this week. And some of these trailers are more interesting than others. Probably the most interesting of all the trailers is that we got another kind of pretty lengthy and meaty gameplay trailer for the upcoming Fire Emblem Engage, which is out in less than two months, <laughs> which is kind of crazy to think about. Uh, and this is a trailer focusing entirely on the emblem system. These are the accessories that you equip to link Alir, or whatever the protagonist given name is, to the 12 past heroes of the previous entries of the series, talking about the engage mechanic, talking about how they uh, have different passive buffs, and how like the, the engage mechanic has a time limit based on like you have to have a charge of meter in order to uh, fuse with the with the hero and end up getting access to the full power of their abilities, the ability to kind of link the different heroes across your roster of the original characters from Engage. So it just kind of basically deep dives straight into that mechanic. I don't really know if there's a lot that we can take away from this that kind of wasn't expected. You do get a lot more footage of a lot of the heroes here. I, I don't I know if it dives into all I, of them. I haven't watched but this trailer. I haven't watched this trailer. So any character can engage with the emblem ring? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So there's there's no like uh, boundaries to it. So it's not like I know I it showed like, it showed a Lear with Marth, and I know I've seen footage with like Celine with uh, Celica. I'm like, does yeah. it have to be Celine and Celica, or can no. anyone? Do and yeah, anyone can do it. And there's and there's like there's no like gender boundaries too. So like a, a male like character can go with like a female emblem or something. They'll just like you know have the clothes and the and the mm -hmm. stuff. So there's no boundaries. It looks like from between them because you see, um, Lynn's like outfit with like certain like male characters in the roster as well. But they're all linked together. Um, but there, there's, certain, there's some certain like different types because you have the sync skill, the engage skill, and the engage attack uh, from these mm -hmm. emblems. Some of them are really, really like it, like it really uh, changes up the di di dynamic in uh, interesting ways. Like you know, Sigurd um, his engage skill like increases the movement rage by a lot because that's what Sigurd does. You know, he gets around mm -hmm. the battlefield really, really fast. Um, and then, guys, yeah. So Okay, now this is, this is technically not new information because so this is technically the first time they've revealed the first six of the twelve emblems. Yeah. So the characters they revealed are Marth, who's from the original game, Corin from Fates, uh, female Corin for that matter, Sigurd yeah. from Genealogy of the Holy War, which is Chow's favorite game, Celica from uh, Fire Emblem Gaiden or Fire Emblem Echo Shadows of Lentia, Byleth, male Byleth from Fire Emblem Three Houses, and Lynn from Fire Emblem. The, the blazing blade now um we already know who the other six characters are because you can you can the mural, there's like yeah. a mural type art in the original trailer that people you know they're pretty distinct designs even if they are in this sort of art style so the other six that haven't really been formally revealed yet are lucina from awakening ike from path of radiance micaea from radiant dawn leaf from thracia 776 and roy from the binding blade oh and erica from the sacred stones so basically, no Hector, guys, no Hector. We have Lynn. <laughs> they have basically I, like I, one major character from each game. From yeah. each I, I kind of feel like they oh. they pick Lynn because she's really popular. They pick Erica because between the two, she's more popular. I feel, I kind of feel like Byleth is like a charity case. Like I guess we can pick male Byleth. <laughs> like, oh, it, 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 it's interesting. It's interesting because like they they like they've like canonized some of these like weapon changes that they've gone through. Like Lynn, like is bow and arrow in this game doesn't have a sword. So she showed her hey, engagement. She's a bow and arrow. She's a bow and arrow when she promotes. She, I, I know, yeah. but she, but when people like when you're playing the game, like you know, you people associate Lin early game with sword, you know. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, There's six men and six women, so it makes sense. Yeah. That's that's why they did male Byleth. Just get rid of wood. Uh, Byleth, so, you are you are an obligation for equality. <laughs> well, they could have done female Byleth and male Corin or something, or they yeah. could have well, done like they, Crom instead of Lucina or something. You well, know? well it's just it's just that for for three houses, like any of the other lords would have been more charismatically interesting. It's, but, it's interesting they how, they, uh, them, so. how they localize some of these, because like, every, like in the trailer, it's like an emblem of like, and then they have the subtitle. So like for so like, like emblem of echoes or, uh, or for lit, it's like emblem of blazing or something. And then like for Violet, it's like emblem of the Academy emblem. because, like, yeah, because, because Violet's like emblem of three houses doesn't sound great or emblem of houses. And, and then if you try to do the Japanese subtitle of like the, the season, it's like emblem of seasons. It's like that doesn't really... That that wouldn't work with the English audience, so I guess they had to I'm find a common guy. one. Farmer <laughs> now, story seasons, guys. <laughs> yeah, it, so. it's 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 kind of just on the on its face, like emblem uh, emblem of echoes and emblem of blazing sound like almost like poetic, and like emblem of the academy, the you know, academy, kind of okay. it's just nerd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I it's like yeah, all of them seem to really shake up. You know the the abilities of your characters and then there's like a uh like a way to like fuse with the emblems as well it's like did you see in the trailer so some of like so, some abilities like you have them these past fire emblem heroes like fusing with the characters so they change up like their um their outfit and like their forms kind of like a more corporeal mm-hmm. kind of form i i this is this is a reference that will go over 99 percent of people's heads but for the few people that do understand it does remind me of that um Bit, like the very very few people have compared it to like um the mankai forms of yuki yuki yuna as a hero it's a it's a tv show but like it, like the basic uh thing is like these characters in that show had like very special like powered up forms and it's very reminiscent of that to the point that's like i wonder if they like took like a little bit of ref- like you know inspiration from that uh when designing these sorts of it's very very um inspir like you know it's it looks inspired. Hey, by sometimes that. you see inspiration from sort of unexpected places. Yeah. Like I remember when I was interviewing the creative, like the director of uh, Scarlet Nexus, he said one of his inspirations was Cyborg 09. And it's like, yeah, I see it. <laughs> yeah, I see it's it. Cool fuck. <laughs> you know? That's great. You know, but you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, you know, five, five and a half minute gameplay showcase of like what the, what these characters can do with these uh, emblems and being able to switch up. You know, it really, it really switches up like the dynamic of the, of the game. Like the, the way you're playing this game is definitely going to be different from how you play Three Houses, for example. You know, because just because of these little tweaks with the, with the emblems. And as I've said a few times, whenever looking at gameplay of uh, Engage, it just. The tra- it's showing well in the trailers, just like artistically and like performance wise, just it looks really clean and like just like they put a lot of budget into it in terms of just its performance and its visuals. Yeah, uh, as much as I like Three Houses and uh, Path of Radiant and even Radiant Dawn, like especially the GameCube era, like the three D Fire Emblem games have never looked great. <laughs> um, Three Houses is obviously the best so far, but still is like. Kind of, it's definitely one of its weaker elements. So this game is clearly visually the best looking Fire Emblem. I wonder if they're still using the same graphical engine, or if they've like yeah, they've it's revamped hard to, it. It's, it's it hard looks, to because I know I know like they so were different. for three houses. Like they did like they re retweaked like the Fire Emblem Warriors mm-hmm. engine for that. So this one like it just looks so different and more vibrant. I, I it makes me wonder. It's like are they still using the same engine? They've just totally overhauled its like visual design or. Like, are they just on something new now? I don't know. It's it's really really hard to tell. But yep, it's looking pretty nice, and it'll be out in just a couple months. So not a lot of breathing time in terms of getting to like I know back when Three Houses came out, Adam had to like he was the he was basically what James has done for our site for Pokemon. Adam basically did for Fire Emblem Three Houses and covering all the I'm different just routes. Being engaged doesn't have like multiple routes. <laughs> Please just be you one. Learn your story. And when, once, yeah. and when you. And when you Back back in my day, there was well, I guess you know even like Roy, uh, Roy's story has some seven branching to it. No, seven doesn't. Six and eight have some have branches. Well, I, I think the issue with like three houses with like the, the different routes is that they all kind of play the same, so it doesn't have offer much variety to to them. That's kind of like the issue with there. Yeah, like I, like the most you can say, like at least with, with fate, so you know, like over like the like the two routes plus like you know the the third route that came out later, but, like at least with the two like routes that they had with conquest and um 
whatever the other one was. Like they played very different from one another. I, I, I'll push back a little bit. I think Three Houses is different uh, endings. Like like the way that each character ends up is pretty pretty darn different. Like Claude ends up the spoilers for Three Houses. Claude ends up fighting like the ghost of Nemesis. The uh, Dimitri ends up fighting Edelgard. Edelgard ends up fighting. Uh, is it the dragon? Is it Edia? I actually, Edia? I actually uh, reread my review for Three Houses recently. Like, how does this hold up? And I think it holds up pretty well. My review. The thing I praised most about Three Houses in my review, I spent a lot of time on it, was its world building and like all the different like parts of the world that are pretty well realized. And my argument at the time, which I still agree with, was that it really comes through with the with the different routes and all the different support conversations and paralogs that all kind of come together to build this world. And I felt that was actually a little bit stronger than the actual front to back story. And it's also something that like previous Fire Emblem games I felt were lacking was like building a believable world. Um, I mean like Fates and Awakening, not so much. Um, the things that I wasn't so hot on, like like I said, some story quabble, uh, quibbles here and there. Um, I said, I, I, I mentioned that um, I, I like the, the map design in the Paralog battle specifically because the map design in the other battles is a little bit more plain. Um, and I know p- people have pointed out what we've seen so far of Engage seems to be a little bit more experimental in its maps, but we'll see how that turns out with its, uh, with its like uh, objectives and things like that. Um, and obviously this sort of... Uh, emblem mechanic is a a totally new twist on top of things that'll change things quite a bit it seems like so we'll see how that turns out and obviously and also there's actually just a tweet um from the japanese account a couple days ago uh mid battle recruiting is back okay okay i mean three houses was of course kind of unique in that you pretty much got the whole class available to you right away and you sort of recruited them from the academy they were all there where now it's a little bit different. You you might m- meet someone in battle that you can recruit the old fashioned way. So that's a Yay. good thing. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. I, I really wonder because like I wonder what late game to end game battle like designs look like in this game because they have to account for you know the abilities of these emblems. Mm-hmm. So I wonder what what sort of like challenges they have like in store. Like how do they tune their their battle design and their encounter design to like accommodate these because these because the emblems like feel like their their abilities are so so useful (laughs) like just on their own that it's like hopefully because i don't want it to be too easy you know like if there's like just a strategy to just like you know this will always work and that will be boring to me so also i hope the support conversations are on the same level or better than three houses Mm -hmm. because those are pretty good in terms of like variety you know some world building some romance some amusing some serious um, I felt those were a big improvement compared to like the 3DS games, which are pretty much just matchmaking simulators, which is fine, but it just got a little bit old, I think. Um, so I'm hoping the support conversations here are are nice and varied, and there's a lot of them. I hope. Yeah, at the, at the very least, what you can say is like the, like obviously because of the the environment and the story of Three Houses, like everyone was generally dressed the same because they were in the academy right. they had uniforms at least this one everyone looks very visually distinct it's like uh, they went really really like all out with like the character design i don't know if yeah. i'm like generally okay like like i generally like I, I like them but it's like wow they really went out there for some of these yeah so um i actually just posted a bit to the website about all the characters that have been revealed so far and like i haven't like i haven't like gone in and dissected who is who exactly and all the different kingdoms that are in play and like who is the relationships that are you know we'll figure that out when we play the game but one thing i want to just point out too is that there's two characters from the kingdom of solm who have dark skin and they look really nice and it just like i appreciate that i know people have kind of pointed out like three houses they had like claude and a couple of other characters that i think people were pretty (laughs) fond of but there wasn't a lot of them and then i think like the 3ds games there was just like I forget their names. There's like one black, one dark skinned guy and one dark skinned girl. Um, but it's just nice to see. But also, even beyond that, I think there's a lot of, I, I like a lot of the characters. Um, you know, some of the designs are kind of YouTuber ish, but. <laughs> yeah, you know. but I mean, they, 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 they're very appealing to that. Like, it, it gets your attention and it makes you think, like, oh, I wonder who, like, what this character is like. It just revealed Anna. 
Yep, they did. She's like a 10 year old now. <laughs> More like scam artists. That's true. Well, that's what she always is, right? <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, it, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to think about like with the recent conversation with like the Yoshi P interview about FF sixteen and like why there's like really hardly any dark skinned characters in FF sixteen and like he try he tries to give a very roundabout answer, like, oh it's like you know it's part of the world, like you know, try to give a realistic world view. While on Fire Emblem it's like, dude, who like you know, who cares? Like we have fucking dragon people, you know? It's like there's like really no like boundaries to that. You don't have to like try to make it justified like oh this is like kind of like the worldview or the nations or whatever this was just like no nah, dude all, all sorts of people like you know exist here you know and then, the, the, like to me it's like kind of like a nice subtle pushback uh, on that con- try to converse like, on that conversation on like trying to like justify you know why you don't have dark skin characters in your game <laughs> especially when it's like kind of like uh, like a, a medieval-esque sort of like time period too <laughs> I don't know. I, when I looked at it, I, I thought like Hugo looked pretty dark skinned. I don't know. That, that's for me. Mm. I, I, I don't know. Some people want it more darker, I guess. I don't, oh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not really. Know. I'm not like really too. Yeah. Weird. One thing that's also sort of interesting is uh that kingdom of Solm. Mm-hmm. It's kind of weird. Um, they call it the Solm Kingdom, but uh, I guess it's ruled by the queen. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if queendom might be a better term. So, like, you have, like, a brother and sister, prince and princess, but it's actually the princess who is basically the more important character, mm. uh, apparently, according to the website. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah. That reminds me of, of Suikoden 5, which also had a queen. Oh, and is right. an extremely good game. Yes. So. so, yeah. I mean, there's only just... It's not that far away. It, it still feels like it's super far away, but it's just around the corner at this point. Yep. So out of all the trailers that released this week, that was probably the most interesting, the one we could dive into the furthest. Though we did get a bunch of other trailers for some upcoming games and uh, re-releases for the next couple months. Uh, we got another trailer for the upcoming Atelier Rise of 3, Alchemist of the End, and The Secret Key. Uh, this is basically a pretty long uh, gameplay trailer, including uh, a lot of footage of gameplay for the Switch. So uh, remind me, uh, Adam, you seem to always be the one that's on top of it. Like The other two, did they come for Switch? Initially, or were those like delayed parts on the uh, original Atelier Ryza games? They came to Switch originally. Oh, they did. Okay. Sometimes they just mm-hmm. know that Switch. Sometimes they have to wait a few extra months before they uh, before they mm-hmm. end up coming out. But yeah, so that, I don't know this this the, sorry, this, ahead, this this new batch of info that basically just confirms the final set of party members and their returning party members, like Empel and Lila, mm-hmm. are from the first game. Uh, and then the Patricia, I believe, is from the second game, if I remember correctly. Yep. She is. Yeah. So she was this girl that uh, Tal was touring. And... Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's like you know it's it's a good mix of like uh, all the new party members coming together and like just rise up. Who is the one again that everyone really wanted to be playable? Who finally is? Uh, boss. 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 Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's the school bully that turns into your best friend. Oh, he's a Sundere. Maybe <laughs> I would say Sundere. He's he just kind of like has a huge wake up call that kind of tells him to be a better person. You know, he's he's not being Sundere to you. He's just kind of being a dick at the beginning. You know, and just shit happens and finally start to be a better person. You know, he's projecting his insecurities. <laughs> but yeah, this seems like this seems like to be like you know going to be a, a good final send off to the to the Ryza series and the Atelier. Doesn't this release like on the same day as Octopath? Yeah, uh, probably. I, I was gonna joke and be like, "It's releasing in February, and nothing else is releasing in February." But, but, you know, but, for, for, but for people who love the Rise of Games, this is a big one for them, especially with the the, the, the large, large, large positive uh, reception to the second game. Like a lot of people mm-hmm. are looking mm-hmm. forward to this one. Hey, the the, the second Rise of Game like was on our top five, I think, last year. So yep. it's just mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't think any of the Rise of Games are bad. I mean, they're all good yeah. in their own way. You know. Yeah. But Another one of the trailers. Of, oh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, I was say, speaking of which, if if you guys haven't tried Rise yet, it's on Black Friday sales on Steam. If, if they don't go on sale too often, and so I, I've never Netflix. played an Atelier game, but basically, based on the positive word of mouth from like James and from you and others for Ryza, basically, if if I found myself saying like I'm going to play an Atelier game, it would be just let me start with Ryza one because that way, if I really enjoy it, I can just move right on into two and three. So basically, you've already sold me. I just need to like you know, can't play them all, <laughs> sort of thing. 
We got an upcoming trailer for the uh, CRPG Dark Envoy, which is releasing at some point next year. I don't believe that we have uh, any other concrete release date than that. So Dark Envoy, I remember when I saw this pop through our news feed, I'm like, this hasn't come out yet? Didn't this release? I remember looking forward to this years ago, and then I saw like one of our very first news posts for Dark Envoy was, it's going to release in late 2020. And I'm like, oh, yep. <laughs> that's that's why. Uh, so that was back around the time. So 2019, 2020 was like when Obsidian before and time. In Exile. Uh, hmm? The before times. Yeah, the before, before times. Just, but yeah, it felt like that was a ago. really strong period of time for like the CRPG uh, genre and lots of different games to look forward to. And this seemed like the kind of like the most like not quite steampunk, but like uh, that semi sort of like dark urban vibe. Something that was a little bit more different than the fantasy or the or the like post apocalyptic setting. And then I I just kind of stopped thinking about it because a lot of those other games released. Like I played Wasteland Three was I think the most recent one I've played. Uh, I guess I also played Wrath of the Righteous. Um, then I saw this news post. I'm like, oh, yeah, this one never released. And it still doesn't have a release date. I guess there's been some wiggling on who's exactly publishing this. Uh, it seems like as of right now, Event Horizon is both developing and self-publishing uh, Dark Envoy. Uh, we got a new trailer from them uh, underneath that new publishing label. And it is still set to release at some point um, uh, next year. This game has a lot to uh, fulfill already because I'm reading the bullet points and the final bullet point uh, for the game features is enemies that are not idiots, winky face. So now, if people play this game and like take clips of like an enemy being an idiot in it, then well, they're not. They're misadvertising the game right there under game mm-hmm. features. So. So every year you know. I try to play a couple of CRPGs, and right now the two that I have on my list are, are of course, Alcat's Rogue Trader. And and this is probably if I wanted to pick a second one, it would be Dark Envoy. Uh, we got another trailer for uh, Rune Factory Three Special. This was announced uh, at one of the more recent Nintendo directs, correct? But only for the Japanese side. Uh, we don't have a Adam. Correct me if I'm wrong. Has this uh, been announced for English, but just no release date, or not even officially announced for English? What are we talking about again? It's Rune sorry, Factory. Rune Factory. Rune, okay, Rune so Factory it's right Three now. Special. Oh, yeah, it's been an, it's it's been announced um, for Western audiences. It doesn't have a release date, correct? Gotcha. So we have a, we it's been announced for both sides of the pond. Has a release date in Japan of March second, but uh, and then of course along with the re- release date announcement, we got a new overview trailer for it. But we just don't have the accompanying announcement for a release date uh, here in the West. So for those that have played, like I know when I ever think of Rune Factory, I think of Chow. Like what I forget what your initial opinions are on three in terms of where it ranks with the rest of the series. I, I still think it's the best game in the series, in my opinion, because it's a lot more simpler without too many like overly complicated mechanics thrown into the game. And it has like the most charming cast out of like the entire series, in my opinion. You know, mm-hmm. like none of the other games have a cast that is like this kind of quirky kind of demeanors right like what, what do i say um i would say like if you're going with the fourth game is probably like the it would have been the best game if they didn't have the stupid town event system then the fifth game is just kind of like a crappier version of four but they fixed the town event system sort of but in the so end three just like kind of put it all before. together are you saying just wait for Rune Factory Three Special for the best Rune Factory experience? Yes, and you can get all the best waifus in this game. Uh, this game has the best, uh, no. the best cast. I'll tell you. So I that's can, what he meant by having the best characters. It just has the best waifus, which hey, for uh, a Rune Factory game is pretty important. Uh, well, now, this I guess... is yet another game that's announced as a Switch exclusive. It's like, will it get a PC release like a month later? Again? Maybe. Well, it, it probably sure. will. You know, at this point, I'm sure it will. I feel like it's, it's a good Four game. and five eventually. Oh, so a question. I, I forgot to, was it? I, I know I shouldn't put this in the podcast, but uh, what is that game that you played, Adam? Is it Sakuna Rice and Fields or something? Uh, uh, Sakuna of Rice and Ruin? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that game have a PC port? Yeah. Yep. It's on Steam. Okay, yep. I, I just keep seeing that on sale on like on the Switch version. I just wonder. Uh, I, I remember they said that the Switch version. I remember they said that like they originally weren't going to do a Switch version because you know it's like a small development team. You know, this indie developer really, and then they were kind of convinced to do a Switch version. And Marvelous is just like that was a good idea because we sold a lot on Switch. <laughs> yeah, we sold more than a million. 
That's yeah. pretty good. Yeah. You should go you should go uh, get it, Chow. It's it's pretty good. Yeah, like I just keep thinking it's like it's like so dirt cheap for the Switch version. It's like there must be no PC version or something. That's why I had to ask Adam for this information right now. I was like, okay, maybe. No, hey, that, I think that game made it into our top ten that year. Two years Wait, ago, two thousand twenty. Sakuna Rice and Ruin. I think it was like I think it's I believe yeah, it made, made it made it made our top ten. Mm-hmm. And that's why I, I, I was asking. It's like, well, I guess we'll see a PC version for Rune Factory Free Special as well. Uh, there is one thing I, I forgot to mention. Uh, one of the things that make four sold like nearly double as much as uh, three is that you can actually play as a female protagonist for once, and three does not have that option. So, oh, okay. uh, if any girls that want to play this game, I'm I'm sorry. Uh, unless they had this is a new special feature, it's. It's I mean, they can still play it. It's okay. It's okay. No, Ken. but I'm just saying you can play as a female protagonist. I mean, that would be a cool thing. I mean, it'll be like Persona Free Portable, you know? But that's a, mm. that's a huge hurdle to add to a video game. We did get another trailer for the finally dated next-gen update for Witcher 3 The Wild Hunt. Uh, th- this is coming out on December 14th. However, this trailer is mostly just kind of like a story accolades trailer it talks about how many people have played it, how many awards it's won, things like that. It goes through like a lot of the story beats, but it's not like a dive in terms of like what has changed. I mean, I'm sure people can still like cross reference what is shown in the trailer versus what is available currently on PC. But there, this like, as far as I can tell, I'm sitting here watching this next gen trailer for Witcher three right now. It's pretty much a story trailer with accolades. It doesn't actually go into like what I was interested in. Like, oh, what did it look like before and what does it look like now? Um, right, exactly. <laughs> so, I guess here, there, it does have a quick blurb where it says like 4K textures, ray, ray tracing, improved gameplay, photo mode, cloud saves. Like, doesn't the original one have cloud saves? <laughs> 60 FPS yeah. mode. Well, I played this in 60 FPS on PC in 2015, I think. <laughs> but Yeah, but what are the people um, playing on consoles? What the hell? Oh, okay. All right. So, um, but yeah, it's... It's The Witcher 3. It's a great game that we, I, th- I think, have never actually officially reviewed on this site. <laughs> so we'll see if anyone wants to uh, wants to. Uh, well, look at this I game mean, we, we, to... we did have a reviewer for it, but, uh, you know. <laughs> that was in the before, happened. before times. The before, before yeah, times. No. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, Witcher 3, uh, when I, I remember I played, that, that basically consumed a lot of my life in late 2015 when it came out. Uh, I don't know. Really, really good game. I know. The, the the all the hoopla about cyberpunk has kind of maybe like soured the developer in some people's eyes but this game did a lot of things well and i think it's well deserved all the accolades it did get if you have missed out on it you know this will be a good really good opportunity to jump in with the new modern console version and an update to the pc version uh and got, got the trailer for the most recent release uh, up on the site uh that goes through all the details there well, i guess it doesn't really go through many of the details but it kind of gives a brief uh taste of the story and a few details about what the uh next gen version will include and then we did get, uh, also from the before times, uh, remember Dragon Ball Z Kakarot? We talked a, f- a couple of weeks ago on the podcast that they are releasing another set of DLC and basically a second season pass for the game. Uh, we don't know a lot of details about D- DLCs 5 and 6, but we do know that the next one is going to be centered around Bardock called Dragon Ball Z Kakarot Bardock Against Fate. Um, but we got a new gameplay trailer about this. It's about three minutes long. Um, I don't know if we have any really big DBZ heads here. I think I'm probably the biggest, but I am like tired of Bardock. I don't well, know. I speaking, feel like he's been... speaking of Goku. Okay, at the at the Macy's Thanksgiving parade, they had a, a float for uh, uh, Super Saiyan Blue Goku from DBZ Super, and then they say if you see him, uh, add on the hashtag hashtag Thanks Goku 2022 or no 22, just 22. So. There you go. Wait, thanks, Goku. Thanks, Goku. What, what, what are we? What are we thinking him for? I don't know. Just a hashtag. Just, thanks, just, Goku. Twenty two. Like, just, all right. Just keeping us safe. <laughs> Thank you, Goku. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I was so kinda, funny. You know, oh, what a great hashtag. I, mean, I, I, I was kind of being. I was kind of being. You know, a bit dismissive about it. But yeah, I don't know. Like, at least Bandit Name Co. Like Dragon Ball Z is a cash cow for them, and the, the way that they continue to support Xenoverse for like a decade at this point with every single like character that gets introduced in all the movies and spinoffs or whatever and the fact that dragon ball z kakarot released three years ago at this point and is still getting developer support like if you're a fan of the ip that's you know this is good news for you just the like, constant reasons to go back for it so i also don't know i don't think any of are certain that there's going to be a fifth and a sixth dlc they announced before that there was going to be a season pass too but now it's like 
there's specifically going to be a, a fifth and a sixth story element. So look forward to that. It does make me wonder, though, because I remember with like the first couple of DLCs, they were introducing super concepts like the um, the Beerus and the, his planet and things like that. But then with the last DLC, they went back to Trunks. And then now they're going to Bardock. So I always feel like they're like, oh, okay, nostalgia works better. So let's ignore Super. Let's go. Just let's just touch. Like here, let's get DLC five, the Tree of Might, and you'll get like <laughs> those characters or whatever. Or DLC yeah. six, you'll get uh, like a Rudy Garden. Torles. <laughs> Torles. I have Torles. no idea what it's like. That's back in the days, and who knows what their actual name was? And the the localizers just went with whatever they felt like. It almost feels like, but uh, yeah. I want to see um, that doctor dude that just fights in a robot in giant yeah. brain pod. But Thanks who knows what DLCs five and six will be. But uh, people that are really being in a Dragon Ball have tons to look forward to for Dragon Ball Z Kakarot, which is still getting some, you know, admirable support from Bandai Namco and CyberConnect too. Yeah, they're also still waiting the last for trailer... um, rollback netcode for Dragon Ball Fighters as well. Speaking of Dragon Ball, you're going to have that, I think, sometime early next year. But that's like the final, final update thing for that, the fighting game. Wow. Samurai Shodown is also getting rollback netcode as well. It's not Dragon Ball, though. <laughs> I know, but I don't like this game. I'm sorry. I, just... I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I enjoy watching it more than playing it. I can't. Yeah, it's I can't. cool to watch, but yeah. gameplay wise, I was like, I don't like this. Yeah. Are, are you going to do Sam Show rollback? If it, yeah, if it's implemented, I'll, I'll install it. I'll get it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I might as well get the Steam version. Like, hopefully, they have a sale. I'm not going to pay full 60, but yeah. I, I, do like, I do like playing Sam Show. So but maybe let's play. So I was reminding myself, like, oh, yeah, I guess Fighter Z did add, or Fighters, whatever it is, uh, did add all of their DLC characters. And I just pulled up a table who they all added. And like, oh, yeah, they finally added Master Roshi. Hell yeah. <laughs> Does it make sense? I don't care. I was like, oh, like this, I, was, I had to think of I was like, oh, yeah, they did add Master Roshi. That's right. <laughs> uh, and then they also they also added Super Baby 2. Who is that? Yeah. I have no oh, idea. He's a guy that gets killed. I'm <laughs> trying to run away. Yeah, <laughs> GT, coming. right? Yeah. Yeah, he's from GT. Yeah. This loser that goes into like people's like cut rooms to to control their minds and steals all their powers. Oh, I, I, so apparently Chow is the Dragon Ball GT expert. So once there's a GT DLC for uh, Kakarot, he'll be totally on board. G okay, yeah, they, they have GT Goku as DLC in Fighters. Uh, to be honest with you, I'd rather take GT over Super. That's how much I hate Super. Dang. <laughs> all right. I you turn every character into like really dumbed down, and stupid, and the plot is kind of like, hey. It's like let's just repeat this over and over again, and it eventually just kind of ends. It's just well, like, GT is a thinking man's anime. Not really. <laughs> I, it had, well, it had terrible. It had like terrible execution, but it had good ideas. That's, mm -hmm. that's how I would see GT. No, y'all, you, you all listen to the Tetracast for our hot or Dragon Ball hot takes. GT. I, is I tell you, Super. man. <laughs> Look, Chow is trying to spread the truth. Okay, he's like, Look, I do, I I do want to watch. Like, I do want to watch that most recent movie, Superhero, just because it doesn't have Goku in it, or or he has a very small part. So, like, all right, I'll watch that at some point. I haven't yet. I watched it. It's not too bad, actually. Uh, it's surprisingly oh, okay. good. I thought the 3D might might have turned everyone off. Dragon Ball Superhero, I... not too bad. You hear it here. <laughs> it's actually good. It's actually good. Mm. Oh, it's actually it's not too bad. It's actually good. That's the full quote. <laughs> Uh, and then kind of in a similar vein, uh, we got a new trailer for the upcoming One Piece Odyssey, another January RPG coming out in less than two months. Uh, so the last time we talked about One Piece Odyssey, they revealed that not only is the Alabasta arc going to have its own like memory segment in the uh, in the RPG that otherwise has an original story. Water 7 will also have a, uh, a memory sequence in One Piece Odyssey. So I actually remember like being confused and making sure I didn't have this wrong. Last week or the week before, we got the one, uh, the One Piece Odyssey Water Seven trailer, and now we've got the One Piece Odyssey Water Seven gameplay trailer. So this trailer is just a little bit longer. It goes uh, goes into some of the gameplay mechanics that will be occurring specifically in this section of the game. Um, I'll be honest, this sort of coverage is a little bit too granular for my takes. Like I don't need to know all the specific like locations that are going to be uh, looked at in this particular memory sequence inside water Trevin, but it talks about like touring on the boats and things like hey. that inside of water. Hmm? Dungeons in JRPGs are becoming an endangered species. That's true. One piece odyssey is like, I got you fam. 
Here are some dungeons. <laughs> <laughs> what if you don't like dungeons? What is that's, this torture? Then? That's actually the thing with dungeon design or like dungeon presence. Like speaking broadly, there's a whole sect of RPG players who think dungeons are bad design and they shouldn't be in any RPG. I disagree with them. I'm that, 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 that's a factor to consider when you talk about dungeon design. Is some people think they are antithetical to to an RPG design. But One Piece Odyssey is here, and it has like actual dungeons. The trailer showed, um, like literally, like a sewer dungeon in the Water Seven. We all love sewer dungeons. You uh, know showing... what RPG has dungeons for you, Adam? Star Ocean, Asta Libra. Oh, Asta well, Libra. Actually, uh, actually, Star Ocean. Asked... <laughs> Wait, I, there's one topic Star... I forgot to bring up. Uh, uh-huh. Did you try the free we have a lot of, like mini games? <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I did the mini game. I have to. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I, I went and downloaded the mini game. There was an Ask Libra mini game that's for free, but it's in Japanese only, where you play as this character that they mentioned in the story once. Oh, oh okay. The is baker's, it, is it the daughter. baker's daughter. Yeah. Yes. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't actually. Do, I didn't actually do that yet. Yeah. I need to go do that someday. Yeah, it's a total different gameplay loop. But holy shit! We'll, we'll okay. mention that. Maybe we'll see that as a DLC someday. I, I want to <laughs> see that. Anyway, and dungeons. <laughs> I know you were kind of you, uh, but this wasn't what you were thinking of. But uh, Star Ocean Divine Force actually has okay dungeons. Like some of the later ones, actually have some interesting oh, things going on. There, there are uh, dungeons in there. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, for me, the low watermark is if the dungeons, if their game is going to have dungeons, just please don't be as bad as Tales of Bizaria. Those ones, or is this oh, Those are both equally bad. They're so okay, those ones are, they're, they so may be boring, boring, but I think they're better than at least the Persona Three and Four dungeons. Tataris. I can. like I like Persona Four. I don't know. I'm yeah, okay no, with the procedural. Persona generated. Three and Four are like they, they're so they they're, they're so like whatever that like I don't even like consider one. I don't even consider them dungeons. Two, they they go by very very fast. At least you're never on the floor for more than like a minute. Okay, fine. Mementos then. Like, Berseria is just like, it wastes your fucking time because the dungeons are so big and like, and linear and boring. Like, there's too much space from going from point A to point B in Berseria dungeons that, like, I just lose interest, like, immediately because they're so, the environments that they depict are, like, boring. From getting point A to point B is too long in them. And like it just it just feels like a big waste of time like doing that like traversing. They're like that. wide hallways in old buildings that are like gray or green. Like all the all the turns are like right angles, just hallway room, hallway room. There's no like locked doors, there's no elevation, or I don't at least that's coming to mind. Yeah, I can I, I just, can I, I got so bored with this area. Uh I did like I don't like I don't want to be frustrated in like it's overly convoluted puzzles, but at least give me like some doors and keys or a lever that switches something. Just give me something to interact with. And but th- th- it's just okay. Bizarre dungeons are bad. I was not expecting to talk about that today, but I will. I will. You know, bang that drum if I get a chance. <laughs> I still remember the last dungeon that game. It takes like three hours to fully navigate through it, but you're not really doing no. anything. But it's that's just that's just a staple of the series. It took me three hours to navigate through Arise's last dungeon. It take, if it doesn't take if it takes less than two hours, then the Tails team screwed up. That's when will apparently. Namco when will Bandai Namco learn not to do this shit? I will also bang the drum that Tales of Symphonia has a awesome final dungeon. That's a category for like best dungeon and RPG this year or something like that. Just to like really like hone in on like how there's a lack of dungeons and RPGs in general year per year. Like I don't know. It would be awesome to done well. Just... It would be awesome to like dive into that to actually like find a dungeon. Like it'd be a game that we'd have to have a lot of people that have played it and dive into like what did we actually like about this? Uh but unfortunately it's a, it's a bit granular and a lot of times only a couple of people have played it, but I don't have time to go into it, but Tales of Berseria's dungeons are... Actually, I did kind of go into it. Tales of Berseria's dungeons are bad for all the reasons I stated. And Josh will back me up on that. <laughs> yeah. Don't worry. I, I'll back you up, too. So I guess reconvene in two months, and we'll talk about One Piece Odyssey's Water 7 Sewer Dungeon and whether or not it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Look forward to it. Tales game. <laughs> Three hours of hallways. Uh, my contribution is like, I don't fucking know, dude. I'm not a One Piece <laughs> fan person. I don't know if this Water 7 dungeon is... Canonically accurate well, to the true. Uh, do, water I seven. Play, do I have to play through water one through six first to understand what are seven? I don't know. <laughs> Can they swim? Uh, I don't know. I think that uh, kind of covers Rupi us. Cannot for, swim. Uh, 
like canonically. Who can't swim? Wait, wait really? Because he double fruit people who eat double fruits cannot swim. What? Oh, I remember that. <laughs> Dude, that's that's crazy. I don't, that's, 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 that's legit something I did not even know. Like I don't know anything about One Piece, but like like it for me, that's like I would think that like the like the protagonist, the hero of this like big, big, big like manga and anime series that's like very water centric, water focused in their world, like would be able to swim and like is like really good at swimming. And now you're telling me the protagonist cannot swim in that? Nope. And neither can Nico. I mean Robin. <laughs> Holy shit, dude. I didn't know that was actually established, but man, that's like, I just, that's kind of like, I, I feel like I've opened my third eye. Straight <laughs> from Wikipedia. Not, not, not a fan wiki. This is from Wikipedia for okay. Monkey D. Luffy. Like others exposed to devil fruit, Luffy cannot swim. When he's submerged in water or, contact, or contacts the sea prism stone, whatever that is, he loses his strength and cannot move on his own. Holy so, shit. There you go. That's crazy. Today we learned. Oh, so why don't they just like, Has any villain tried to kill Luffy by just like <laughs> put, like throwing him overboard or something? Oh, there's a whole there's a whole arc of the manga that takes place underwater. Oh my is god! How is this dude still alive? He's like in an air bubble the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. You, you come to the Tetracast for our very naive, uneducated One Piece takes. <laughs> I mean, I'm learning a lot through Adam right now. He's, he's, he's yeah, an Adam's a relative One Piece expert. Adam, are you going to review One Piece Odyssey for us? Nope. No. Well, you will you at least review the dungeon I think Paige is on us. deck. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'll do the dungeon analysis. <laughs> okay. The accompanying uh, piece to the One Piece Odyssey review. All right, we got two other uh, little headlines here. Neither of these are quite trailer related. Uh, this one is just something that Adam kind of noticed. Uh, and then I th our friends over at Gamatsu reported on it. Uh, Ubisoft PC games will start releasing on Steam again for the first time in like six years. Ever like for the last for the, the like four years. Four years. The paradigm for the last while has been that they have their own Uplay launcher as well as uh cross launching over on the Epic Game Store. But Steam, for whatever reason, was out of the picture. However, it does uh, seem like Gigamatsu does note that the last PC uh, Ubisoft PC game that made it uh was available on Steam was Starlink. Battle for Atlas on April April thirtieth, twenty nineteen. Oh, so, okay, so it hasn't been quite as long as I thought. But uh, yeah, Assassin's Creed Valhalla, which finally I guess released all of its DLC like two years down. It's so much so that Adam, Mister One Hundred Percent over here, ended up couldn't, deciding that he was had had enough of it. Um, Assassin's Creed Valhalla will be releasing on Steam on December sixth, and that's I guess going to be the opening of Ubisoft games releasing on Steam again. Though, however, it seems like it's going to. This is I the last I I last played a Ubisoft game in like the mid early 2010s where like you would click a Ubisoft game on Steam like I'm thinking that Prince of Persia Forgotten Sands game that came out like 2009 or so you you'd click it on Steam and it would just open up your Uplay launcher and it seems like it's just going to be kind of a new version yeah. of that where you, where you still have to have it it'll say like on the Steam page uh third party required Uplay or whatever so it's just like, oh, this is back to how it was when I last played a Ubisoft game. I haven't played any since then. Uh, but for those that really like playing all their PC games on Steam, you can now avoid Uplay or the Epic Store. I guess you can avoid the Epic Store completely. Uplay, I guess you still got to have on the back end in order to actually launch these things. Uh, but now they'll be available on Steam again, starting with uh, Valhalla on December 6th. Adam, final thoughts on Assassin's Creed Valhalla? Too big. <laughs> too big. Yeah, too big. <laughs> 7.8 out of 10, too much big. Yes. And then the other uh, little piece of uh, kind of tertiary news that we have is uh, in the last week or so, we had an update for the China Hero Project. And one of the games that we've talked about a while, back when I kept confusing it with uh, another indie game, this is Lost Soul Aside. It looks like knockoff Final Fantasy 15. Uh, this was originally unveiled on the China Hero Project several years ago. Um, but the most recent update is that we got a new trailer for it and it the knowledge that it will be published by uh, by Sony. So Sony will go ahead and publish Lost Soul Aside. It will be available for PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. We got a new trailer for it. However, as far as I can tell, still no word on a, even a release window for this, even though this game was announced um, 2016 or so. Yeah, first, uh, 
Yeah, first released in yeah. trailer 2016. The development team kind of finalized over in like 2017. And it's kind of just been a little bit of, I won't say dev hell, but just kind of working behind the scenes since then. But now that it's got a new publisher, they've basically announced that over a new trailer for the game with some new footage. I don't know. We've had a few surprises come out of the China Hero Project before, so this might be one to keep our eye on. Uh, but it just with no new release window other than just the publisher information, still kind of like, oh, okay. Thanks for checking in, Lost Soul aside. I guess we'll follow up when you start ramping up towards a, a release window. But it's, the trailer yeah, I is mean, mostly gameplay it, focused, which is fun. It's interesting because like that, like there's a re- there's renewed like interest now in the China Hero Project. I mean, like it's always been like you know a, a thing for a while now, especially like you know releases like like uh, you know Lost Soul aside and like I know Anno Mutationum was also part of that, and there's several other uh, titles under it. But it, it's kind of there's like renewed interest in it uh and like uh, in it because of uh genshin impact and uh, sony's the relationship with uh, mihoyo uh on genshin impact like to see like the the massive 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 success of genshin impact and their continued partnership with sony like more than ever like uh sony like uh, you know ha- establishing these relationships with, with chinese developers is like it's, a, it's just stronger than ever because of genshin impact I remember one that we reported on back in like 2019 from the China Hero Project was AI Limit, which looked like basically someone really enjoyed Nier Automata and wanted to make their own version of that. But that one's also kind of gone quiet since like 2019 or so. It, so it, I don't it's, know if it's uh, been... it was featured in the the recent Ch- uh, China Hero Project like reel uh, that came out. Oh, okay. So it, it, it got montage development. footage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's still in development, like, but quietly, but it's mm-hmm. still, you know, the signs of life from that. So, you know, I think there's like a there's a just a big push of like you know take your time, take all the time you need to like kind of like get these games where they need to be, and you know and and they'll do well. Um, and I, I think people really want to be like, hey, they really want to show the world that like you no, know, like China's Chinese developers are some of the best in the world. And you know, Genshin Impact may have been like the big wake up call for a lot of people internationally, and these people really want to get like you know that recognition as well of like. No, we we want to we want to show the best that we've got out of the gate. I guess AI Limit was China Joy, not China Hero Project, but I guess both are sponsored by Sony. So it's, yeah, I'm not 100 percent sure of the still, delineation there. I, I think it's still part of the China Hero Project because it like in the recent reel, it like it it was featured alongside Lost Soul Aside, Adam Mutation, and also AI Limit was there as well. Gotcha. Yep, Lost Soul Aside now published by Sony. A pretty beefy looking new trailer for it. So nice to know that it's still under development. But unfortunately for those wondering, oh, this game's not out yet. I guess it has a release window now. No, not n- not quite. But a good looking for it regardless. Yeah. And the final little smattering of headlines here are mostly uh, one sales update and a couple new release dates. Uh, sales update. We kind of touched on this a tiny bit earlier, but near Automata shipments and digital sales have topped 7 million total. And then the near replicant remaster from last year has sold one and a half million. So basically it does seem like that near automata. Uh, I, I'm trying to remember if we had discussions back when replicant was releasing. I, I'm pretty sure that all of us here on the panel probably knew that it wouldn't have reached the highs of, of automata just kind of, or automata. I'm going to pronounce it both ways interchangeably. Um, automata obviously had like the really striking character design and kind of like lightning in a bottle wasn't sure if it was going to be topped unless it had you know a formal sequel but i think one and a half a replicant comparing to how near originally performed still i have to think is seen as a victory compared to yeah, where near was a decade ago good. yeah i mean that's it is still very widely regarded as you know like at the time like not a not a great game in its original release but had like really great ideas but now you know try, trying to make that all work it, it also had some weird like you know some things going against it because you know a good chunk of the audience who really liked Papa Nier, you know, decided to pass on re- re- the Replicant uh, remaster, remake, whatever. So, he, like, they're still waiting for that, for sure. They still want it. And uh, I wonder if, if they ever decide to, you know, uh, go that down that path. Because realistically, how many sales would that, with the same exact game, but with a different protagonist, um, how that would do, I don't know. Mm. But... Like all things considered, it being almost two million is still a pretty good victory because Near Replicant is still, I, th- I think, to a lot of people's eyes, like is not as good as Automata, 
I I I I do like Replicant. Like you know, it has. Like I said, both I like both of these games a lot. They have very different strengths and different weaknesses. Like on any day of the week, like I might just flip flop one or the other. You know, it's just I I don't consider one is better than the other because I just see them both as like very distinct things of like they do one does something very well over the other while the other does you know excels at different things over the other and, i found a um game informer interview with yoko taro from 2019 who had estimated that the original near sold about half a million so near replicant has basically tripled that so it has to be seen as a success yeah. at the thing uh, uh, and i did i remember seeing in my email newsletter like brave xvs crossover near automata so like it's still getting that you know that crossover mojo that oh, yeah. i've never we, had we, since we, it's released so yeah we talked about the rainbow six siege crossover you know and they have oh yeah we're over. getting yeah. we're getting one of the nears in rainbow six siege <laughs> i don't remember yeah. i forget who well, they, they, they have a Alex. replicant skin yeah they, they have a replicant skin for one of the operators and then like they announced recently that uh there's we have to be our automata skin for another one of the operators so it's both of the near well, games I- being represented I remember someone Rainbow saying, I can't, hon- I honestly can't tell if this is supposed to be Brother Near or Papa Near just because it wasn't, uh, wasn't well yeah. executed. It's like, uh, I can tell that's Near, I guess. So it was Brother Near's outfit, but with like an older guy in it. Yeah. So some people joke yeah. that it was like Papa Near cosplaying its Brother Near. Yeah, which is uh, very silly. Just to, just to give a little, like the lineage of like Automata's sales, like in May 2019. Uh, uh, Near Automata passed four million sales. Then, uh, December twenty twenty, it reached five million sales, and I think that was the, like the last time we really heard like hard figures. So now, two years later, uh, another two million sales, and that and that number is only going to like get higher because the Near, Near Automata is also getting a, a TV anime adaptation early next year, and you know, and I'm sure it's going to find a new audience, and uh, some of that uh, new audience will want to check out the game. Like, hey, I want to see what's up with this. It's only, it's only going to get higher. And we'll close out with a couple of release date announcements. Uh, we have one coming out in December, and that is P-Cube's Adventure Academia, The Fractured Continent. It'll be relaunching on December 9th for PlayStation 4, Nintendo Switch, and PC. And accompanying the launch date for that was a new trailer for the game. I'll be honest, I have nothing more to say on this. <laughs> I, I, I checked out the... okay. I was interested in like trying out this demo. One, I still can't find the demo on Steam uh, for this, even though they said that the English demo is out. I still can't find it on Steam. Maybe I'm just lying. Two, like there's a, a mostly negative like Steam rating on this, and like I have to add. I, I wondered why, so I went to like the Steam discussions, and like there's like this big kerfuffle about like uh, it had issues with mouse and keyboard, so that was part of it. Um, and then, then after that, it's just like very scattershot, like, you know, UI is a bit challenging, can't rotate the camera, et cetera, et cetera. But it's really, really crazy to see that, like, a good chunk of why it has, like, a mostly negative Steam rating because early, like, review user reviews that came out with it is because it had issues with, like, mouse and keyboard off the, off the bat. And, like, it just has, like, painted, like, a very... Like, I don't know what to think about this game. I have no idea. I've never played this game, obviously. But, like, it's just, like, it just seems so... I don't know. It doesn't doesn't seem great off the bat, and that's just um, very, just because of a, of a initial glance at the fucking Steam rating uh, user review rating page. It looks like it has six positive reviews and twenty three negative reviews, and, and like most of that is like it's like not even like in English language as well because this is released in now like in the hmm. uh, yeah no English reviews reviews. on Steam yeah so, so no one can find the demo. Yeah. Yeah, so I yeah, I didn't, like they said the English demo is launched. I'm like, where is it? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I guess I don't know, man. I don't know. We so we got an indie game release date for next January. <laughs> we were almost at the point where we can say good things, not things releasing in January. So back in May during the Indie Live Expo, we got the announcement of a co-op action RPG called Gatewalkers. And we had a story trailer and a gameplay trailer for that and its announcement back in May. Um, This week, we learned that we'll be launching in January on the 12th for PC and currently only announced for PC. Uh, Alongside the announcement of the release date, we got another trailer that basically shows um, some of the four-player co-op. So this game looks like 
uh, and a top-down isometric twin stick, not shooter, like twin stick hack and slash kind of Diablo-esque sort of mindset. Like so it seems, yeah, Gauntlet. That's actually a really good comparison. Yeah, this looks like kind of like Cyberpunk Gauntlet, um, but it seems like it seems like it could be a, like a, a fun like turn off your brain, you know, romp with friends. Uh, if you had nothing else going in January, but I guess like it's it's launching around the same time as One Piece Odyssey, so we're gonna be too busy uh, in those Water Seven dungeons <laughs> critiquing those to play Gatewalkers. No, but I'd love but to yeah, my brain though. <laughs> no, it, it looks it looks fluid. The gameplay trailer looks like pretty flashy and pretty like it, it has a lot going on screen at once, and it's maintaining a, a, a pretty solid frame rate. So uh, this is, I believe, the debut title from the from the developer here who is self publishing a two Softworks. Let me check on that real quick. Yeah, I think so. Oh no, they've got they've also got uh, a few other games on Steam. Uh, Lovecraft Tales and Climber: The Sky Is the Limit. So very small studio with a couple projects under the belt. But Gatewalkers looks like it might be a fun curiosity uh, in early January if you're not interested in One Piece before February, where you know everything lands at once. And then the last release window that we have is that in early 2023, East Asia Soft will be bringing Mugen Souls to the Nintendo Switch. Uh, it is currently available on PC and PS3. Um, this is developed by Compileheart originally. And I don't know much about, like, I know this game has a reputation, but I don't exactly know for what. But I, know, I saw that some people were really excited to see this. Just kind of interesting to see the Switch get kind of this niche niche release, formally localized in English uh, on the Switch. Uh, for What's next the reputation year. of this game? Uh, Zach scored it and gave it a seven. <laughs> That's a good reputation. That, that, I, I feel like the, the the weird thing that they're touting with this release is like East Asia's the East Asia soft press release is like this will be intact with the original Japanese version. It'll be faithful to the original release. Uh, why why do they keep saying that, Adam? Wait, I lied. It, Zach reviewed it and gave it an eight. Oh shit! <laughs> we need to leave that review. We need to leave that review. Oh no! Got the Zach bump. Well, anyways, as far as I know, the original release from East America removed some uh, hot spring bathing content, and now it's back. Yeah, the, the characters uh, look very young. I do not know what the ages of the characters are. I do not keep up with any of the, the things of this game. Um, fourteen. Either way, yeah. I guess when they originally released on PS3, some of the cut like CG events, like you were there at the hot space. I don't know if they like it or they were completely cut or they were censored via like Steam, you know, whatever. I don't know. But East Asia stuff is like, no, 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 no. We're, we're, we're back. We're going to bring this to the Switch. And we know Nintendo loves uncensored games. So we're going to keep it intact just for you Switch players. Um, but I, I, this also got a PC release in 2015 that I don't know if it's like if the PC release is like intact with the original Japanese version. I think it's also censored. Uh oh. Then yeah. Then maybe the Switch is the definitive version now for some people. Or you know, I don't know anything else about this game pretty much. <laughs> yeah, New they, they, Souls they, is on Steam currently mixed. Mm, that that they. Uh, East Asia Soft is like following up on the release of Moero, Crystal H, and Seven Pirates H for the Nintendo Switch. This project marks the third major partnership between Idea Factory and East Asia Soft Limited. So, congratulations oh. to them. What's the appeal mm-hmm. of this game? Guys, can you explain? Uh, you it's know, re- you it's really, go, really go, uh, cute. You can go to Steam forums or go to like the dark parts of the internet. I'm sure they'll let you know what's up with this game. Damn, I don't want to go to the dark web. <laughs> well, you're asking. That's all I can give you. But yeah, sometime in early 2023. So we have we learned of the port. We learned it's being localized, but we don't know the release date. Look, so the Nintendo Switch players are being fed next year. Okay, Mugen Souls, mm-hmm. Agarest War. Hell oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, I guess I even forgot to mention during when we were talking about Nier. Like, oh yeah, just last month, literally had a Switch port that was really well received. So, haven't played Nier Automata, and you're looking for a quality JRPG to play on Switch? There you go. Wow, why, why play Nier Automata when you can play Mugen Souls and Agra Store? <laughs> uh, because you have good taste. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, yeah, that's the last headline I've got. I don't know who put that last. Probably me. There it is. Remember when I mentioned that this might be a more loose podcast? Oh, here we are. Pass the two-hour mark, as we do. Uh, and I didn't even give Chow a chance to talk about Papa LaCroix. Papa LaCroix? Papa, Chow, here's uh, a chance. Papa, 
So if you look at the Japanese uh, lettering, it says Popolocris story, but I don't know if... Uh, what is Popolocris story? What is this? Okay, so this is a PS1 RPG uh, that was released a very long time ago, back in 1995. Before, 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 before think, times. Think before like any of us were born, sure. I'm sure. Yeah, I think it's like oh, 1995 man. or 1997, somewhere around. I, I was definitely born. Absolutely. <laughs> I was a mature adult by then. Okay, so anyway, it's like a fairy tale kind of story type. So it has a very fairy tale, childish art style to it. But in my opinion, it is a very good game. But uh, how, how do I say it? It never got English release until it got to the PSP version. But the problem is, if you play the PSP version, it is basically the first and the second game being cut down, and they just took the highlights of the game and sold it as that. <laughs> it's like a director's cut, but like it's like but the but only the best parts, I guess. Yes, but that but that's a terrible way to play it. You know, it's mm. not the ideal way to play it. You know. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's let, let me give you the breakdown of like the first story that got okay. completely cut out from the PSP version. Okay. Right? So in the original game, basically the main character is being invaded by this guy called the Gami Gami King, right? All right. Uh, the Gami Gami King, or the, he's like supposed to be like a evil demon king, and he's trying to uh, steal the king's crown, right? Okay. And then during that, you know, that heist. Uh, he finds like there's a sweet, sleeping woman in the tower, and that's supposed to be his mom. And yeah. and during this heist, it's like he's like, huh? I thought my mom's dead for all these years. That's that's what he's been told, right? Mm. So you don't know that's his mom yet in the PS1 version. It just his king, the king just tells him, "Don't go to the tower," okay? And that's mm. it. And but in the PSP version, the king immediately tells him that that's his mom, and here's a sword passed on to him. Which is the dragon sword? Uh, okay, so there's like no emotional build up. There's like okay, I so get, that's I like in the PSP version. He already got the sword immediately. But if you play the PS1 version, he he basically he visit the tower again and he gets a sword from this dragon spirit. And he wonder who is this dragon spirit, right? So it's completely like different course of the story, right? Mm-hmm. And what's the most funny thing is like when you go and fight the Gami Gami Demon King, it's this guy that's been kidnapping people from the village. And they've been like fed to like it's like they've been treated like so much hostility that the people don't want to go back to the kingdom. So they're not like Demon King is not actually like evil. He's trying to do bad things, but he's just too nice of a person to be a Demon King. That's kind of like the joke of it, right? You know that I think it's kind of like the Earthbound kind of like Porky uh, scenario, sort of, but in a in a nicer way, not with like a because. Not like in a sinister way, because if you think about the Earthbound and Mother Free, that's more like Porky's up to no good, right? But this guy is trying to like up to no good, but he's doing good things instead. So he's like a failure of a demon king, right? That's no good. You got to be a really bad evil demon king. Okay, but I-, I forgot to mention, the reason why I'm replaying this game again is because there is an English patch version that released recently, probably like four months ago. Okay, I, and- I vaguely remember this, yes. And this English patch is actually really good. It translates like everything like perfectly, but it sparks some controversy for, for an odd reason. Uh, so this patch, because in the beginning of the game, there's a, you know, they subtitled the anime opening scenes and you know all kinds of stuff like that. But in the first scene, there's a voice dialogue and there's no subtitles for it because the scene is voiced, right? In the Japanese version, there would be like a Japanese narrator talking, right? And this fan patch dubbed over that, and people were so upset about it, and they were like, can we get the subtitle instead? And, you know, if you're doing fan patches, that's kind of hard to hack in, right? You know? Okay. Trying to put, like, some type. Yeah. And I think, like, one, the PR person for the fan patches, they tell him, it's like, well, you can try to get a hearing aid or something like that. Oh. And so oh. um, I'll make sure they fan dubbed it. Yeah, they fan dubbed the narrator with, a, hmm. with somebody, right? So hmm. Okay. Because you know, I think hacking and adding subtitles is kind of hard to do. So they, you know, just hack. So they just have someone dubbed over the audio, right? And someone, I, I'm not sure that people are just being trolls to spark like you know subs are always better kind of kind of wars, you know, sort of thing, you know. And the patch kind of sparked controversy because of it because they 
you know, the guy that telling the town was like, well, you should just get a hearing aid. And it's like, what, what have I still can't hear? It's like, well, that's too bad. And that kind of caused everyone want to cancel the patch or something like that. But I'm not kind of sure if it's like a troll trying to spark. It has to be a sub only purist kind of thing, you know? That's true. It's tricky. I would say just like be thankful for what you get, you know, because the normally it's like it's fan, a, fan I, projects are tricky. Fantastic. Yeah, but it got people got so mad that they had to lock the topic in the ROM hacking channel. That's how Jeez. bad the thing is. So yeah, you can imagine something like kind of trivial in my opinion to kind of lock the entire topic because they feel like like the guy saying that is like, well, that's too bad. They they felt like they're like attacking the disabled or something like that. You know, it's like I I don't know. It's just I don't want to get to those cancel worms, right? It's it, oh, so. it's tricky. But you know, but overall though, but beyond that, like it seems to be a solid fan translation. It's a solid fan fan, and I forgot to mention that you know when they get to the city where the mm-hmm. Gami Gami Demon can kidnap all the people, uh, they you know they they're robots there, right? And when you talk to them, they like to pronounce like c words with an s h. So it's like welcome to this shitty <laughs> the localization. It's like the South Park meme with the with the city walk, you know. Welcome to shitty walk, you know. It's like it's like that in there. I don't know if it's if it's just like a localization flair that they added. I thought it was kind of funny, right? Yeah. But How's the game itself? Like, it is now that very... now, now that you're not playing the like the director's cut PSP version. I, I played this a long time ago, so I have been it before back a long time ago, and I think the second game is actually one of the greatest games ever made. Uh, it had a very emotional ending that makes me like still feel sad today. Like I, it's a happy ending in the end, but the things that they go through, it's so sad. It, basically, everyone dies, and they had to have a giant reset. Let's just say that, but it's a well earned reset. Let's just say that. Uh, because when you think of like this kind of art style, it is like very cutesy. You know, you can't imagine like such a depressing kind of like, story in like the later half of the second game. So. It's just kind of like hard to imagine. Uh, like I forgot to mention that, like in the PS One era, there is a second game, and the second game is like basically because the first game was so successful, they basically upped the production of the second game so much. They would have like full voice acting for all the storyline. The game is expanded from one disc to three disc. They like you know did a lot of things. Like it was so popular to the point that they made anime series, like manga, and everything, and all the fandom died because they made the third game on the PS2, and the third game sucked, and now nobody cares about it anymore. It kind of it kind of reminds me of like Sakura Tyson or Sakura Wars, how the series used to take over Japan by storm, and now nobody cares about it anymore. Right. So, uh, I would say give the second game a try too. If there's ever a fan patch created for the second game. I think there is with machine translation, but obviously I don't recommend that. There is, you know, it's like if you can understand Japanese, play it in Japanese. So that's the way to go. Uh, if you is the sequel Ryan, called? Uh, like, I see there's a 3DS game, Return to Popolo Croy: A Story of Seasons. No, the, if you it's just called Two Popolo Croy: Story just, Two. Oh, okay. uh, it's in the PS One. You know, it's a free disc game. It's in the greatest hits. You know, it's like you can see it. It's it's out there. Uh, it's very obscure, uh, like it's the English audience, I would say. But you know, it's... no, but you're you're good. You're good at sniffing these out and like uh, identifying when they have these. Like 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 Josh said, it's kind of tricky with fan products because obviously someone just decided that they wanted to present this to the world and expand the audience for this game, but did it you know in their own free time on a volunteer basis. So I do kind of understand when people say like, no, I wish you did it this other way. He's like, well, okay. Like, <laughs> I just can't imagine something like, something like a one sentence kind of sparked this much controversy, you know, <laughs> you know, I had to lock the, the fan page of, of the translation, you know, on, on the forums. Uh, pe- people, you know, tempers get heated quickly. So sometimes it takes a bit of skill. It's trying to keep things simmering down, but no, thanks for la. Uh, I'm sorry that I kind of missed it. You had that listed up when we were talking about uh, Pokemon and Star Ocean and Valkyrie, but then I ended up accidentally skipping it. So we'll squeeze you in here at the end. So mainly so we don't have to end on Mugen Souls. We can end on Popola Croy instead. <laughs> I also forgot to mention that in the second game, they completely de- tweaked the battle system. 
So there's like skill trees and all kinds of things added to it. But the thing is, if you're playing the PSP version, they only took the battle system of one, but without all the features from two. So you can't imagine how how weird the PSP version is. Do you know like where the licenses of these have ended up now? Like if they were to ever re-release them, who would be the ones to be to be re-releasing them? Oh, uh, probably Xseed because um do you remember Tom from Xseed or when he yeah. worked at Xseed? Yeah. Uh-huh. He was basically the biggest pop up Chris fanboy and he would tell me how amazing this game is and, and that's why I tried it for the PS1 back in the day when it was you know still Japanese only right because mm. he keep like non-stop raving about how great this game series is so that's why I gave it a try back in those so, so it's like are the license like at Marvelous then like in Japan for example mm, could be I don't know okay. uh, I just remember like XC took the publishing rights for some of it because I remember they made a some spin-off games there's even a story season spin-off version of it oh you know, that they did yeah that's um, the one that i brought up that i thought is this the sequel oh no this is story seasons crossover <laughs> yeah but i know the psp one there is an english version of the psp version and that was done by age tech so but they're gone anyone, yeah yeah, yeah does anyone remember them i uh, remember that was armored core yeah, I remember their translation for the PSP version is actually like really dry. It's like for every early yeah. localization. Uh, they, they're very, they're very, uh, they're not very flavorful. They're just very yeah. to the point. <laughs> so and this I, remember, lot, I remember their armor. And core. this game could use a lot of that because a lot of character sprites have like very com- comical. Uh-huh. Like the main character starts off of like these two bigs and wedge kind of soldiers that join him to find, oh, that's funny. Okay. find like the crown. And they have like very bad animation, like mm-hmm. not like bad animation, like very comical type mm-hmm. animation. Right. And as soon as the prince goes into like trouble, cause the main character is this prince, right. Trying to get his dad's crown back. And as soon as he gets in the first time of trouble, they fucking ditch him to die. <laughs> it was just kind of Jesus. hilarious. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, I also forgot to mention that the music is amazing. Uh, but the thing is, it's very hard to find a soundtrack out there. It'll be like, it'll be missing a lot of tracks. So it's uh, just, it's the problem with with obscure Japanese games these days. Yeah. You just can't find the proper. If YouTube can't find it. It doesn't exist. <laughs> it's like you have to go to Nico Nico Video. Uh, uh, <laughs> God damn! Oh. oh, the days of Nico Nico. I mean, I know it's still there, but I remember when that was our only option for some of these streams. But yeah, yeah if anyone can get it, get get to the second game, you're in it for a treat. If you could, you know, deal with machine translation, I guess, if, if you're playing for ROMs. But obviously, if you could understand Japanese, that would be the superior experience. So, but yeah, I highly recommend the series to anyone that wants to try it. Better than Valkyria Revolution. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. I bar. Well, thank you, everyone, uh, all your participants here on the podcast. And thank you so much for all you listening to the TetraCast here this week. Uh, Again, we hope you had a great Thanksgiving if you're from the U.S. and celebrated that. Uh, If you have made it all the way to the end of this podcast and you're listening to us on either YouTube, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever, uh, leave us a rating, leave us some feedback, give us a comment on our webpage. Uh, We do like to read those and let us know what we're doing well and what we're doing poorly. Uh, Go ahead and see all of the pokemon coverage up on the site we got all the pages for the, the different evolutionary trees we got james's guide uh and all that others uh information for pokemon scarlet and violet up on the site uh and then also the final fantasy 35th anniversary poll we'll retweet that on our socials periodically uh over the next coming weeks and then keep an eye out for the um reader's choice poll for 2022 that will also be hitting all of our socials which by the way you can find us uh just search for rpg site on twitter youtube facebook or instagram we'll be on all of those uh we have a discord channel uh it'll be um at a link underneath the youtube video or you can go to discord.gg slash rpg site uh it's been getting a lot of influx of people to our discord over the last couple of weeks so there seems to be a, a elevated level of chatter right now so go ahead and join up there if you haven't already and uh sounds like we have one more regular episode of the TetraCast next week, and that might be our last standard episode for the year. It's amazing that we've already come that far. So uh, we will be back next week. Not 100% sure what we'll talk about then, but it'll be our last chance to kind of wrap up some thoughts and some whatever we're playing through before getting into the deliberations soon thereafter that. So until you hear from us next time, stay safe and take care, and we'll see you guys later. Oh, yeah, this podcast episode shouldn't be that long, guys.